Thomas still hadn't fully woken up. Looking tired and grumpy, he walked over to where he had left the two men the night before. He tore the tape off of one man and kicked him hard. The man woke up and looked at Thomas in fear. Missy thought it looked as though he had been tortured by his thoughts all night. What are you doing here? Thomas asked, even though he had already guessed their purpose. The man stared at Missy before he said, Someone paid us good money to kidnap this woman. He gestured with his chin to Missy. When Thomas was speaking to the man, she saw a different side to him, one that was fierce and savage. It made her feel a little uneasy. And when the kidnapper had said what the objective was, she got a chill down her spine. Were you going to tie me up? Missy asked in shock. Thomas kicked him again and said, Who sent you? Tell me the truth. Otherwise, I'll take off the last piece of clothing you have on and test my taser on your balls. The man looked down at his underwear and shivered in fear, instinctively crossing his legs. Missy was stunned at how cruel Thomas sounded, and she looked at him in disbelief. Brown, Mr. Brown, the man said. His name was Simon Brown. He asked us to tie her up. He probably wanted to use her to threaten Alexander and force him to plead guilty. He's the only suspect, but they haven't found any hard evidence to convict him. Simon had been paying close attention to the movements of the Mitchell family and had found out, quite by accident, that Samantha's new assistant was actually Valerie Mitchell. After the man had answered the question, he looked at Thomas with fear and resentment. He lowered his head and said bitterly, I thought she lived alone. I didn't think she would have a bodyguard. And what a childish bodyguard. What did you say? Thomas asked, pointing the taser at him again. No, nothing, he answered. The other man had also woken up by that time and was looking at Thomas with pure hatred. The night before, when they had come to, they had realized that they were in their underwear with tape over their mouths, and they knew they had been caught. They had feared that they were going to be tortured. But Thomas had had fun with them instead. He had started by shaving their heads, but he hadn't been satisfied with that. He had also drawn funny pictures all over their faces with a permanent marker. When he had tired of playing with them, he had gone to sleep on the couch. Thomas loved sleeping more than anything, and he slept more than most people. He had gone to sleep late the night before and had been woken up by Missy before he had slept enough, so he was in a bad mood. I'm going back to sleep. Don't disturb me, he said, glaring at the two kidnappers and Missy as a warning. Then he lay back down on the couch. The two men looked at each other bitterly. For their own sake, they didn't dare to do anything rash. Thomas might have been young and immature, but he had a taser, and they knew how much it hurt. Missy lived alone. The couch was only a love seat and was barely big enough for her to stretch out on, let alone Thomas. He curled up and tried to get comfortable. I'm hungry! Missy said, standing in front of the couch with her arms crossed. Good for you. Go find something to eat. Just don't bother me, Thomas replied, turning around to face the couch with his back to her. She didn't know what to do with herself. She was very anxious with nothing to do to distract herself, and she wanted nothing more than to go outside to clear her mind. But I can't go out, she thought. It's too dangerous. Simon sent these two men to kidnap me, and they didn't complete their task, so he'll probably send more. I don't want to get caught and become a burden to Alex. The day before, Missy had wanted Thomas to get out of her apartment, so she could go out by herself. But with the two men tied up by the door, it was clear to her that Samantha had been right. She couldn't go without protection. There's something I can't figure out, Missy said after a while. Why didn't Simon kidnap Sam? Why did he want to kidnap me instead? How did he even know my identity? She poked Thomas's back and said, Hey, pay attention to me. He ignored her, so she poked him again. He sat up, annoyed. You want to try that again? He said with a threatening voice. Oh, you're so fierce, she said, giving him a playful smile. Since she had found out that he had come to protect her and had saved her from being kidnapped, she found him a lot more attractive. She forgot about the mean way he had acted at first and focused on all the good things he had done for her. 
He made me a delicious stew, she thought, and even washed the dishes. And he slept on the couch, even though it's way too small for him. The more she thought about it, the more ashamed she felt about the way she had acted towards him. She decided that she would be nicer to him. He answered her question without moving. Many people, including the police, know that my sister is Alex's wife. If Simon attacked her, it would be too obvious and would arouse suspicion. As for you, you're a foreigner who changed her name. It'd be harder to trace your connections to Alex, so you're the smarter target. Simon could easily deny that he had anything to do with it and could claim that he doesn't know who you are. Get it? Then he grinned slightly and added, Plus, you're weak and stupid. Missy ignored his insult and considered what he had said. How did he figure all that out? She thought. I wonder if he watches a lot of crime shows. She was still hungry, so she went to the fridge and looked inside. There was only a carton of milk, a few eggs, and a couple dried up lemons. After searching the cupboards for a long time, she finally found a bag of unopened potato chips. Thomas opened his eyes and watched her eat at the coffee table. She sounds like a hamster when she eats, he thought. She thought she had disturbed him and said apologetically, I'm really hungry. I'm trying to eat quietly. Is this what you eat for breakfast? Potato chips? He asked with a look of disgust on his face. No wonder you're so short. It's fine if he doesn't want to cook for me, but I'm starving, she thought angrily. I have to eat something. Thomas yawned, stood up, and walked into the kitchen. After a while, he returned with a plate full of crepes. There had only been a few ingredients in the kitchen, but he had found some flour, eggs, and a bit of milk, and that was enough for him to witch up a batch of crepes. Come and get it, he said, setting the plate down on the dining table. Then he walked back to the couch and said, Don't disturb me again. Missy looked at the plate full of golden crepes. There was even a sweet lemon sauce with them. Crepes! she exclaimed, delighted. My favorite! She jumped up and down, clapping her hands. Hey, save me some, he said with his eyes closed. Missy was so grateful that she risked being scolded again and said, Why don't you go to sleep in my bed? It's very big and I've got a warm blanket. Close the door and then I won't disturb you. The spacious bed and cozy blanket sounded very attractive to Thomas, and he could see no reason to reject the offer. So he got up and went to the bedroom. When he crawled into her bed, his body stiffened. It was so soft and comfortable, and he was completely engulfed in her scent as if she was lying there beside him in his arms. His face turned red, and he felt a little embarrassed. A cold wave swept through the region, causing Springfield to start winter early, almost overnight. The people in the streets and alleys were bundled up to keep warm. Some people took the sudden cold weather to be a warning, indicating that something bad was about to happen. The gossip around the Brown family drama seemed to have quieted down for a short time, until an old case was reopened by one of the top lawyers in Springfield, Lincoln Gordon. He accused Simon of having killed his second wife, Victoria Walton, and making it look like a suicide. While Simon was basking in the joy of having finally taken care of his son, Alexander, for good, the court sent him a document. The police arrived at his residence shortly after to arrest him. They also arrested an old housekeeper at Brown Mansion, who was being accused of committing perjury. It wasn't a simple case, but with developments in forensics, the original DNA evidence had become traceable, and the court had a lot of solid evidence against Simon. They called for an emergency hearing and started the court proceedings immediately. Because the Brown family was incredibly wealthy, and because Simon's and Alexander's cases were high profile, they expedited both trials to happen on the same day, so as to avoid the media circus as much as possible. David told Samantha about the trials and asked her if she wanted to go. There were a number of people who wanted to attend, but only a few were allowed access. They were being called the trials of the century because of the power and influence of the Brown family. It was widely acknowledged that if Simon and Alexander were convicted, it could shake the country's economy. 
Yes, I definitely want to go, Samantha replied. She desperately wanted to watch them and had plenty of time on her hands. Zoe knew Samantha had all of her attention on Alexander at that time, so she had postponed all of her jobs. On the day of the trial, David arrived to pick Samantha up. She was wearing a gray pantsuit, a white high-collar shirt, and high heels. She also wore a felt hat that covered half of her face. She looked dignified, but kept herself low profile. David realized something when he saw her. The Samantha that I remember has become someone else's wife, and she must have put a lot of effort today to look nice for that dog, Alex. He also realized that taking her to the trial was helping her relationship with Alexander and hurting himself in the end. He felt a little ashamed of himself just thinking about it. There was a swarm of reporters outside the courthouse. One by one, those with entry passes showed their permits and went through the security checks to go inside. The reporters without entry permits could only wait outside for the trial to end to interview people afterward. Samantha and David made their way inside. When they entered the courtroom, they bumped into Tim, who was already inside. Tim and Jack had been in charge of not only helping to collect evidence, but also watching the Brown family while Alexander had been detained. Mrs. Brown, why are you here? Tim asked, shocked. When he saw the man standing beside her, his expression froze. He quickly put on a polite smile and said, Mr. Matthew, you're here too. What a surprise. David didn't usually make an effort to be polite to anyone other than Samantha, and he was especially rude to people associated with Alexander. He replied, Mr. Clark, since you were busy with work and couldn't bring Sam here, I thought I'd bring her myself. His intention was to mock him and Alexander's other employees for not thinking to include Samantha. He thought, when Sam needed help, none of you were around. Are they actually going to question me for bringing her now? Tim laughed dryly. He could already imagine how upset Alexander was going to be when word got out that Samantha was there with David. All of the Jackson family were in attendance, as they were family members of the victim. Mia looked at Samantha with pure hatred. Her mother had just died, and she thought that Samantha's husband was responsible. When they passed by her, she said, Sam, after Alex goes down for taking my mother's life, I'm coming after you. Just you wait. Brady was sitting next to her. He looked at Samantha and said, Wow, Sam, Alex isn't even out of the picture yet, and you've already got yourself another man. Then he turned to David and added, Mr. Matthew, I have a bit of experience with this woman, and let me tell you something, she's nothing but a liar and a hypocrite. Brady, David said, greeting him with murderous eyes. He was starting to get concerned about Samantha's reputation being by his side. He took a half step toward Brady and whispered in his ear, Watch yourself. He hadn't said anything too threatening, but Brady felt a shiver down his spine. Mr. Matthew, ignore him, Samantha said. He's not worth the effort. But her words made Brady so angry that his face turned red. Mia saw an opportunity to say something nasty to Samantha, but when she was just about to speak again, David's sharp eyes looked at her, and she backed off, so frightened that her hair stood up on the back of her neck. When she came to her senses, Brady and Samantha had already left. David, what did you say to Brady just now? Samantha asked curiously. She answered truthfully. I just told him to watch himself. Because his days are numbered, he thought. The judge and the jury were in position, but the plaintiff and the defendant were still not present. Everyone was speaking softly, and the atmosphere in the courtroom was solemn. Are you nervous? David asked gently when he saw Samantha looking in the direction of the defendant's seat. She licked her lips and said honestly, A little. She took off her hat and placed it on her knees, revealing her delicate facial features. She was of particular interest in that room, as the wife of the accused. And, as David was an important figure in the business community as well, many people were discreetly watching the two of them and gossiping. Who's the lady sitting next to Mr. Matthew? 
I've never heard of him having a wife. A financial reporter asked his colleague. The marriage of a business tycoon like David Matthew was worth paying attention to. Perhaps she's a business alliance, he thought. In that case, it might make an interesting story. That's not his wife. Her name is Samantha Miller, his colleague explained. She's a model who has just recently gained a lot of fame in the fashion world. She's married to Alexander Brown. Is that so? the reporter asked, continuing to watch the two of them. There's something not right about that. The way Mr. Matthews looks at her is the way a man looks at a woman he loves. You can see it written all over his face. Well, there was a rumor that they were married before, but David came forward and clarified that it wasn't true, his colleague said. Why are you planning to change from being a financial reporter to a paparazzo? No, no, I'm just gossiping. Soon, everyone's attention was attracted by Simon and Alexander, who had just walked in. The court was in an uproar. Everyone was talking to each other at once. Why is Simon sitting in the defendant's seat? What's going on? Who's that handsome man sitting in the plaintiff's seat? The judge read the charges. Simon was on trial for the murder of his second wife, and the man accusing him was Alexander Brown. At that point, everyone came to the shocking realization that the man they saw in front of them was, in fact, Alexander Brown. They had never seen him without his mask. Everyone was dumbfounded. They opened their eyes wide and looked closely at the man sitting in the plaintiff's seat. They all started talking at once. That's Alexander Brown? No, it can't be. I thought he was an ugly, disfigured man. When did he become so handsome? I heard that Alexander Brown was sick and wouldn't be able to live long. This man looks healthy and strong. Many of the businessmen in the crowd were kicking themselves for having judged Alexander from the rumors they had heard. They regretted not thinking of setting him up with their own daughters. He was as handsome as he was rich and powerful. Furthermore, he was considered a business genius and a wise young man. Albert was also in the courthouse. He was trying to keep a low profile and was sitting by himself in a corner. He looked at Simon in the defendant's seat and felt relieved. In every scenario that he could think of, the outcome of the trial would benefit him. If Alexander lost, Albert would have no competition for the inheritance. If Simon lost, Albert would still get all the inheritance because Simon would hate Alexander so much that he would never leave him a penny. Ultimately, Albert would come out on top either way. After he had that realization, he was in a much better mood. The judge called for order, and the prosecutor stood up to give his opening statement. The evidence had been collected, and Alexander didn't have to do or say anything. It was all up to his lawyer, Lincoln. Alexander saw Samantha in the crowd, and it instantly put him in a bad mood. He had deliberately sped up the process in order to keep her from getting involved. He wanted to protect her from the scandalous things that might come up in the trial. But there she was, sitting in the gallery, listening attentively. And beside her was David, who had tried to fight with Alexander at the police station. He obviously brought her here, Alexander thought bitterly. David was quite different from Alexander. He would give Samantha whatever she wanted, and wherever she wanted to go, he would take her there. No matter what the consequences would be, he would sacrifice everything for her. David and Alexander made eye contact for a brief moment. Both of them could see the hatred and hostility in each other's eyes. Samantha stared at Alexander without blinking. The expression on her face was intense, but she showed no emotion. She was nervous for him, but when she saw him sitting in the plaintiff's seat without wearing his mask, her worries were overcome by another emotion that she couldn't quite identify. Samantha and Alexander looked at each other from across the room. Alexander's light brown eyes were quiet and cold. It wasn't in his plan to have her there. She didn't understand why he looked so displeased. Is he upset that I'm here? She thought. Or is he angry that I'm here with David? Without David's help, I wouldn't have been able to enter the police station to see him. I also wouldn't have gotten into the courtroom today. 
I would have been stuck at home, waiting anxiously and helplessly for the final result like everyone else. But I'm not just like anyone else. I'm Alex's wife. I have to be here. When she had that thought, she lowered her eyes and smiled. Alexander saw it and frowned. He gave David a dirty look, and then he withdrew his gaze from both of them and focused his attention on the trial. It had reached an intense stage of interrogation. Simon had spent a lot of money on a very good lawyer, who was doing his best to refute the material evidence provided by the plaintiff. Samantha gradually became nervous again. Simon's lawyer is very good, she thought. Besides, it isn't easy to collect evidence in a case that's more than 20 years old. Simon has that advantage. Don't worry, David said, comforting Samantha gently. Those were just the appetizers prepared by your husband's lawyer. I'm sure he has a more powerful trump card. David had been keeping an eye on Alexander's lawyer, and his spies kept him up to date with the latest news. He had roughly guessed Alexander's plan, and although he hated the man, he couldn't help but admire his intelligence. Lincoln said calmly, Your Honor, the prosecution would like to call a witness to the stand. A man who looked to be about 60 years old entered the courtroom. He was wearing a staff uniform from Brown Mansion. Charles? Simon cried out loud, shocked. Charles Harrison was one of his trusted butlers, who had served him for more than 30 years. Charles was sworn in and sat down. Lincoln started asking him questions, and he answered every one honestly. He said to the judge, Miss Victoria Walton was indeed killed by Mr. Simon Brown. Can you tell us the whole story, Mr. Harrison? Lincoln asked. Well, because Mr. Brown was deeply in love with Miss Walton, Miss Mitchell, his wife at the time, chose to take her own life. Half a year later, she passed away. Mr. Brown married Mrs. Walton. But the Mitchell family was unhappy about it because it had happened too soon after their daughter's death. And what happened then? Lincoln asked. Well, you see, at that time, Mr. Brown wanted to use the Mitchell family's power to open up the European market. So, in order to not offend them, he chose instead to kill Miss Walton to prevent his business and status from being threatened. Charles continued with his testimony. There were three people working at the Brown mansion at that time, including myself, he said. The other two died suddenly, and I honestly don't know how I made it out alive. I should have died, too. Can you tell the jury what happened? Lincoln asked. I was pushed into a lake that winter, Charles responded, and the water was so cold that I instantly lost all feeling in my arms and legs. Luckily, I was saved by one of Alexander's men. Charles's subtext couldn't have been more obvious to the jurors. The other two workers had suddenly died because they must have been killed by someone. And it wasn't a coincidence that he had been pushed into icy water. He was openly accusing Simon of all of it. You're lying! Mia shouted, jumping up from her seat at the side of the courtroom and pointing at Charles. My grandfather wouldn't do that! Charles, you traitor! All these years I've trusted you for nothing! Simon shouted, angrily slamming the table. Your Honor, he must have been bribed by Alex to say that. The judge pounded his gavel and shouted, Order! Mr. Brown, Charles said, If it wasn't for the fact that you wanted me killed back then, I would have absolutely been loyal to you. You were the one who abandoned me first. You can't blame me for being heartless. Lincoln brought the court's attention to an envelope that contained an agreement, signed by both Simon and Charles, and a check signed by Simon, which had never been cashed. It was proof that Simon had paid Charles a large sum of money in exchange for his silence. Charles told the court that Simon had paid the same fee to the other two workers. Simon's face turned pale. They had solid evidence against him. He never thought that Charles would have kept the check for so many years. Alexander looked at Simon coldly, as if he was looking at a stranger. This man isn't worthy of being my father, he thought. He'll kill anyone who crosses him. Then, the trial continued with the matter of Simon's attempted kidnapping. 
Two men with shaved heads, who looked bruised and embarrassed, were brought to the witness stand, one after another. After they were sworn in, they each confessed that Simon had hired them to kidnap a woman. They said that his intention was to use the woman to threaten Alexander. Then, Lincoln called Missy to the stand. Because her identity was to be kept confidential, she didn't reveal her name, but she confirmed the testimonies of the two kidnappers. After hearing all the evidence, the court recessed until the jury reached its final verdict. The evidence was conclusive, and the general impression amongst the crowd was that it wasn't looking good for Simon. When everyone was seated again, the jury announced the verdict. We find the defendant, Simon Brown, guilty of murder in the first degree, and guilty of attempted kidnapping. The judge announced that Simon was sentenced to life imprisonment. Simon's face was ashen. He collapsed on the defendant's seat and looked at the ceiling. It's over, he thought. My life is over. How could this have happened? Impossible! It can't be! Mia shouted, bursting into tears. This can't be happening, she thought. How could my grandfather have murdered my grandmother? Brady also had a look of disbelief on his face and kept saying he wanted a retrial. Thoughts were racing through his mind. They can appeal the decision, he thought, but they have to go through the proper procedures and that's going to take a while. Who knows if a retrial would change anything anyway? The evidence was pretty conclusive. Brady's eyes were lifeless and filled with panic. His mother was dead, and his grandfather had been sentenced to life in prison. He felt like he had no one left to protect him. The Jackson family was considered wealthy, but it was because of Lorraine. Even Brady felt like the family wasn't far from collapse. Samantha let out a deep breath. Alex won, she thought. I can't believe he won. But she had another concern. Lorraine's death still hadn't been resolved. She turned to David and asked, What about Lorraine? Don't worry, he said. It will be resolved today. Samantha relaxed considerably. The court recessed, and when they reconvened, Alexander was in the defendant's seat. He was being charged with the murder of Lorraine. He didn't have any solid evidence to back him up, but Lincoln presented a lot of circumstantial evidence to prove his innocence. The autopsy report stated that Lorraine's time of death had been at precisely 11 o'clock. Lincoln showed the jury the camera footage from the hallway at Brown Mansion. It had been 13 minutes after 11 when Alexander had left his room. Considering the time that it would have taken to arrive where Lorraine's body had been found, he argued that Alexander wouldn't have had the time to commit the crime, so he couldn't be guilty. Albert, who was sitting in the corner of the gallery, suddenly turned pale. He pursed his lips and clenched his hands into fists on his knees, trying his best to remain calm. He didn't want to lose his composure. Alexander's eyes swept over to him and paused for a few seconds. Albert stiffly pulled the corner of his mouth and put on a forced smile. But as hard as he tried to look natural, his smile reflected the terror he felt inside. He fiddled with his watch nervously. Does Alex know that I'm the murderer? He thought. If that's the case, why hasn't he accused me already? He couldn't read the expression on Alexander's face. Albert had always thought that Alexander was ruthless and frightening when he was wearing his silver mask. But seeing him with the mask off, he felt even more terrified of him. After hearing all of the evidence, the jury left the courtroom to deliberate. When they returned, they announced that they had found Alexander Brown not guilty. After hearing the verdict, Lincoln raised the issue to the judge of Lily's police statement. She had given false information that had resulted in Alexander being arrested and accused of murder. He asked that a trial date be set in the following days to accuse Lily of defamation. Alexander's trial was over, but the murder of Lorraine still hadn't been resolved. If the murderer wasn't Alexander, it must have been someone else who was at the party that day. Most of the guests had an alibi that proved they couldn't have done it. There weren't many people left who were possible suspects. Simon's eyes were unfocused. Being convicted had been a huge blow to him. And on top of that, Alexander was being released on the charge of murdering Lorraine. So, the killer was still out there. 
As Simon was being led out of the courtroom, he fell to the ground. All of the stress had been too much for him. It was as if he had aged ten years in one day, and he couldn't even stand by himself. Alexander walked up to him and said calmly, Father, enjoy the rest of your life. I hope you live a long time. You monster! I'm your father! Simon exclaimed, pointing his trembling fingers at him. How dare you treat me like this! I'll get you, Alex! I promise you! This isn't the last you've heard of me! Father, you can't do anything to me now. Why should I be afraid of you? Alexander said, walking away. Staggering to his feet, Simon shouted, How did I get cursed with such a miserable son? If I had known you would cross me like this, I would have put an end to you sooner. Alexander was in high spirits as he watched Simon struggle. Few people felt pity for Simon after the truth came out during the trial. He had killed his wife, bribed his workers, and tried to kill his loyal butler. Most of the people who had witnessed the trial felt as though justice had been served. Simon was escorted out of the court and sent to prison, where he would stay for the rest of his life. Samantha observed that throughout the trial, although Alexander had looked indifferent, his eyes had never moved away from Simon. No matter how much he hates him, she thought, Simon's still his father, and Alex just sent him to prison for life. No matter what, that couldn't have felt good. After having lived with Alexander, Samantha knew that he wasn't as cold-blooded as people thought he was. This isn't fair! I won't accept it! Mia shouted, suddenly losing control and making a scene. Alex is the murderer here! Why is he being released without charge? She screamed hysterically. My mother was murdered! I want justice for her! Your court is colluding with Alex! You're covering up for him! I'm going to sue you! Order! Order in my court! I will have order! The judge said sternly, banging his gavel repeatedly. If you're unsatisfied with the decision of this court, you're welcome to appeal, following the appropriate channels. My court is absolutely fair and just, and I won't allow you to disrespect my courtroom. If you continue, I will hold you in contempt of the court and have you escorted out. Some people found it funny and were whispering to each other secretly. The Jackson family has such brainless children. Right? Their son is a scumbag, and their daughter is reckless and ignorant. I think their family is destined to fall apart. They won't be able to survive this. Mia wouldn't calm down. She was very emotional. She kept shouting, and the security officers finally took her away. Brady felt embarrassed for his sister and didn't say a word to defend her. He lowered his head and quickly left the courtroom to avoid being laughed at. He didn't understand. How could Alex get away with this? He thought. He should have been sentenced to life in prison. How can he have been found not guilty? The trial officially came to an end, and the judge announced that the court was adjourned. Everyone in the courtroom started to discuss the trial amongst themselves. Several prestigious people tried to get close to Alexander to congratulate him. For many people, the trial that day symbolized the rebirth of Alexander Brown. In the eyes of the public, he had returned, handsome and strong. Lincoln greeted the businessmen and reporters that surrounded Alexander and tried to get rid of them tactfully. Please forgive us, but Mr. Brown really can't make a statement at this time, he said. We have some pressing matters to attend to. We really don't have time to talk. Jack and Tim also went to Alexander's side to help with the crowd of people that were trying to get his attention. Samantha kept to the side quietly, watching as people from all walks of life flock to Alexander's side, surrounding him as if he was a celebrity. They used to pity him, she thought, shaking her head. Now they all want to be on his good side. Let's go, David, Samantha said lightly. Don't you want to talk to Alex? We can wait, David said in a voice that only the two of them could hear. Although they were separated by a sea of people, he could see that Alexander's eyes were firmly locked on Samantha. But he didn't tell her that Alexander was looking at her. No, he has too many people with him, she said. It's not a good time for us to talk. 
Samantha tidied her clothes and put on her hat. She and David walked towards the stairs and slowly made their way out of the courtroom. She finally understood what the emotion was that she couldn't identify earlier. She felt resentful. No one would notice her leave, but no matter where Alexander went, he would be the center of attention, and that would always create a distance between them. She had always expected that one day he would return to his former glory. However, she never thought that it would all happen so quickly. She was caught off guard and didn't know what to think about it. Alexander was filled with disappointment as he thought, Sam left the room so quickly. She didn't even come over to congratulate me or look over to give me a smile. A feeling of anger grew inside of him. What's wrong with Mr. Brown? Jack quietly asked him. He noticed that Alexander looked upset. Tim gestured in the direction of the audience and said simply, Mrs. Brown. Jack was confused and didn't respond. What's going on with them now? He thought. Do we really have to go through them fighting again? And why is Mrs. Brown with David? As soon as they walked out of the courtroom, Samantha and David were surrounded by reporters and camera flashes. Samantha pressed down her hat to block the flashes of light, and David took her by the arm to protect her. The reporters bombarded them with questions. Miss Miller, I thought you were married to Alexander Brown. Mr. Matthew, you once denied that there was any relationship between you and Miss Miller. Aren't you worried that your presence here today will raise suspicion? Miss Miller, Mr. Matthew, may I ask why you've come to the Brown trial together? Samantha, why did you come here with David? Is there something more between you two? Are you here as a show of support to your former boyfriend, Brady Jackson? Are you still in love with him? They were all entertainment reporters who had rushed over after hearing that Samantha had appeared at the trial. The other financial reporters and news reporters had focused on interviewing the jury members and attorneys. Samantha frowned. She wanted to explain, but the reporters weren't listening to her. They were all talking at the same time, making it impossible for her to speak. David sneered. He looked extremely intimidating and said threateningly, Do you people really have nothing better to do than attack an innocent woman? The reporters went silent for a moment. Samantha took advantage of that moment to say, In answer to your questions, I'm still married to Alexander Brown, and Mr. Matthew is just a good friend who's here to support me. My being here today has nothing to do with my relationship with Brady. And to the reporter who asked me about my feelings for Brady, can I ask why you think my personal feelings are any of your business? Samantha had no problem giving sarcastic answers to reporters who were pushy and impolite. The reporter she was responding to had an unpleasant grin on his face, and Samantha knew he was going to write a story that put her in a bad light. Her eyes swept across the crowd and finally stopped on that reporter. She said, I work in the fashion industry, and I'm dedicated to showing off new designers, not giving speeches. I hope that you reporters pay more attention to my work and the shows I put on, and less attention to silly gossip. The reporter twitched his mouth in embarrassment at being singled out. David looked at Samantha, and his eyes filled with pride and love. He was impressed by how willing she was to protect her reputation. Samantha, can you tell us why you came to the court today? It's very difficult to get permission to sit in on this court hearing. How did you get it? Probed a female reporter in a kind voice. It was a reporter from a rather powerful media company. After she asked her question, the other reporters didn't speak again, and they all waited for Samantha's answer in anticipation. She came to see me, said a cold voice from behind them. When the reporters heard the voice, they all spun around to see who had spoken and instantly began talking amongst themselves. Who is that? Which family is he from? He looks a little familiar. Several bodyguards moved people out of the way, and Alexander stood in the open space created by a human wall. Close behind him stood Tim and Jack. Someone in the crowd recognized Jack and asked, Isn't that Jack Smith who always follows Alexander Brown around? Another ripple of excitement went through the crowd as they confirmed that Alexander was, in fact, the main witness in the day's trial. 
The atmosphere was palpable as the reporters waited to see what would happen next. Alexander looked at Samantha with a burning gaze. He extended his hand to her and said slowly, Sam, come here. Samantha bit her lip and hesitated for two seconds before making a decision. She turned to David and said, I'll go over, but don't go yet. I want to thank you later. Then she walked toward Alexander. She didn't walk fast, and she was the center of everyone's attention. The crowd had plenty of questions, and one reporter in particular was asking questions to anyone in the crowd who would listen. If this is Alexander Brown, why is he wearing a mask? How does he know her so intimately? Why is Jack Smith looking at her with such respect? When Alexander had emerged from the courtroom, he had seen Samantha and David surrounded by the group of reporters. He had also seen David's protective posture and the way he had kept the reporters from getting too close to Samantha. He hadn't liked what he had seen, and he thought it was clear that David was in love with his wife. Alexander had wanted to rush over and snatch Samantha away from the other man. He wanted to hug her tightly and kiss her so that he could show David that she was his. He also wanted to remind Samantha that she was his wife. When they were only a couple of steps apart, Alexander took hold of Samantha's soft hand and pulled her into his arms. He held her tightly and kissed her forehead without any hesitation. The surrounding crowd gasped. Some even cried out in shock. Why aren't you waiting for me? Hey, Alexander asked softly. His voice was deep and elegant, and he sounded gentle and affectionate. I... I thought you were busy, said Samantha, and then she looked around at the people crowding them. She hadn't expected Alexander to do such a thing in front of so many people and cameras. I was busy looking for you, Alexander said calmly. Excuse me, are you Alexander Brown, sir? A well-known male reporter asked. Alexander answered with a nod of his head. He looked at the crowd and saw many shocked faces. Then you and Samantha are... The reporter began, hoping that Alexander would finish his sentence. She's my wife, Alexander said frankly. Again, all sorts of exclamations rose from the crowd. As the reporters quickly scribbled down the notes, other well-known people had left the courtroom and were watching the commotion. The reporters noticed that many of them had calmly and politely nodded to Samantha and greeted her, and the reporters realized that they already knew that Samantha was Alexander's wife. Recognizing what a huge scoop it was, many of the reporters were talking over each other, trying to ask Alexander further questions. Mr. Brown, may I ask when you and your wife got married? Asked one. Alexander, what do you think of the friendship between your wife and David Matthew? Asked another. Mr. Brown, why did you wear a mask before? As the excitement of the crowd grew and the volume got louder, the waiting bodyguards started to move people away from Alexander and Samantha. They cleared a space for the couple to walk, and Alexander held Samantha's hand tightly before he walked forward and said to her, Let's go home. David, Samantha said as they passed. She wanted to thank him. When he had seen Alexander expose his marriage, he had known the real reason behind it. Alexander had wanted him to see it. Mr. Matthew, thank you very much for today. I'd like to show you my appreciation with a drink. Alexander said as he stopped in front of David. David immediately detected Alexander's tone. It clearly meant that Alexander thought he was meddling and that he should stay away from Samantha. Knowing that it would be rude to refuse, especially in front of the crowd, David smiled and said, I'm free now. Let's go. Alexander silently cursed. He had hoped that David would make an excuse and decline the offer of a drink. Samantha was sandwiched between the two men, and she could feel that the atmosphere was tense. As they arrived at their car, Alexander gave Tim the address of a private member's club, and Tim relayed the information to David. Both men climbed into their vehicles, and Samantha followed Alexander. As soon as the car door was closed, Alexander pressed Samantha to the seat and kissed her hard. Oh! she exclaimed in surprise. Tim blinked and calmly raised the privacy screen. 
After several days of longing, Alexander had been unable to wait any longer. He passionately kissed Samantha, grabbed her waist, and moved his hands over her body. Samantha, he said softly as their foreheads met and his lips grazed her mouth again. Hmm? answered Samantha as she accepted another kiss. I won't make a fuss about it this time, but don't see David in the future. Remember, you're mine, Alexander said before he kissed her again. Samantha sat up in her seat and pushed Alexander's chest with one hand. Alex, you thought you were being righteous, didn't you? she asked. Alexander had indeed felt that way. Samantha was furious, and she felt overwhelmed with emotion. He always takes his short temper out on people, makes people feel helpless and small, and hides things from me, she thought angrily. Looking at him sitting next to her, Samantha began to feel a little depressed. She had thought that the revelation of their marriage to the public would make her feel happy, but it hadn't. Instead, all she felt was melancholy. Why does she look so unhappy? What is there to be unhappy about? Alexander thought with a frown. The members club was well known amongst the elite of Springfield. It was always difficult to secure a table, and only people like Alexander could get one at the last minute. Samantha had never been there before, and she noticed that the interior decoration was unique. There were plenty of antiques and pieces of furniture that looked like they were very old, and there were private areas behind the scenes and hidden doorways. There was also a courtyard outside. In a private room, Alexander and Samantha sat on one side of the table, while David sat on the other. The staff serving them were discreet, and they brought drinks and snacks seemingly from nowhere. Their movements were elegant, and Samantha noticed an expensive scent in the air. David, you've helped me so many times, but this time I don't know how to thank you, Samantha said as she picked up her drink and toasted David. Sam, you're most welcome, agreed David with a smile. He knew that if he didn't accept her thanks, Samantha would be disheartened. The two of them exchanged further pleasantries, and gradually their conversation changed from being overly polite to friendly chatter. Alexander looked at them and interrupted, Mr. Matthew, if you need anything, just let me know. I've said it before. David smiled faintly as he remembered that Alexander had also warned him before that Samantha was his woman. I don't lack anything that you can give me. Thank you, Mr. Brown, he replied, glancing at Samantha. You won't give me what I want, he thought. Samantha's cell phone started to ring. Sorry, let me take this call, she said as she saw Thomas's caller ID. She got up and began to walk out before pausing and anxiously looking at the two men. Sam, don't worry, I can't fight, David said lightheartedly. He could see her worry. Samantha didn't know whether to laugh or cry. Okay, well then, you guys can just talk then. Once Samantha had left, the gentleness on David's face disappeared. Alexander clicked his tongue and said, Hypocrite. David retaliated with, Samantha likes it. Alexander stiffened and said coldly, She has nothing to do with you. David lowered his eyes and took a mouthful of his beverage. When he raised his eyes again, he met Alexander's gaze and smiled sarcastically. Alex, you have a well-thought-out plan. You've been casting the net wide for a long time, and I know you're still in the stage of closing that net. You only need to exclude Sam from those who are useful to you, he said. Other than when he had spoken to Samantha, Alexander had rarely heard David speak, and what he had said was all about Samantha. He realized that David had the ability and wisdom to rival him. Alexander's eyes lit up. You want to declare war on me and try and snatch my wife? He asked. Yes, but not now, David said. My goal is very different from yours. I love her. Her wish is my wish. You mean I don't love her? Ha! Alexander said mockingly. I'm not interested in what you feel, David said. He knew that if Alexander didn't love Samantha, and Samantha had found out, she would want to leave him. 
If that happened, he wouldn't hesitate to snatch her away from him. Not interested in what? asked Samantha as she came back into the room. The conversation between her and Thomas had been brief. Thomas had told her about the two men who had tried to break into Missy's apartment. Jack had taken the two men away earlier in the day to arrange for their courtroom appearance. The Lorraine matter wasn't completely finished, and Samantha had told Thomas and Missy to stay calm and out of the way until everything had been resolved. Alexander looked up at Samantha and lied. Mr. Matthews said that he's too busy to watch your upcoming show. Huh? Samantha asked, and then she looked at David for clarification. David looked coldly at Alexander and smiled. I am busy, but Samantha's show is important. Mr. Matthew is a very busy man with multiple personas, explained Alexander. He doesn't have time to watch the show. Mr. Brown not only has to manage Blue Whale Enterprises, but he also has to deal with his family. Wouldn't that make you even busier? David said with a glint in his eye. And you have to send someone to find your brother, Leonard. Alexander was getting more and more annoyed. No matter how busy I am, I still have time to accompany my wife, he said. Mr. Matthew, you don't need to squeeze time out of your schedule for my wife. David laughed slightly. Oh, my schedule isn't crowded. I always have time to give to my good friend Sam. You have so much time. Well, is that because you're not married? Don't worry, I can introduce you to a woman if you need one, gloated Alexander. The two men continued to exchange words, and Samantha's head went from one to the other like a tennis ball over a net. She wasn't quite sure why they were arguing. All right, stop, Samantha interrupted. Can you both stop now, all right? David and Alexander looked at each other, and both of them closed their mouths. They didn't want to waste their time talking to each other. Samantha thanked David once again and walked with him out to his car. Alexander stubbornly followed her and stood by her side with an expressionless face. On seeing them exit the members' club, Tim hurriedly walked over. Mr. Brown, Albert went to the police station. He said there were clues about Lorraine's murder, he said quietly. What? Samantha asked. When everyone had suspected Alexander, Albert had been one of the main accusers. She couldn't believe that he had already found a new clue when the suspicions around Alexander had only been put to bed less than a half a day earlier. Are you hungry? Alexander asked Samantha. She checked her watch and noted that it was almost time for lunch. A little, she replied, nodding. Let's go to another restaurant, Alexander instructed Tim. The other man looked at him unsurely and asked, don't you want to go to the police station to find out what's going on? We'll eat first. There's no rush, Alexander replied. The person who should be anxious is not me, he thought. Inside the car, David's driver turned to him and asked, Shall we make a move on Brady tonight? David looked at the scenery flying past the window and replied, We'll wait a little longer. Samantha knew that Alexander owned a lot of property. He was rich and picky, and he liked his own space. What she hadn't expected was that he would have a small villa just off one of the busiest streets in the city. But there she was, in an unfamiliar kitchen. There was plenty of food, and some ingredients had already been prepared by the staff. Samantha wanted to eat noodles, but she wasn't sure if Alexander would be happy with that. Looking around, she didn't know whether to laugh or cry. After thinking for a moment, she set to work. The dining room was just outside the kitchen, and Alexander was sitting on a dining chair at the table and watching Samantha. He could see her slowly working away, wearing an apron. Her expression was gentle and quiet. Mr. Brown, while you were awaiting the trial, your wife asked Thomas to look after your cousin, Missy. It was Thomas who caught the two kidnappers, Tim reported in a low voice. There were a lot of things that had happened in the court that day, and Alexander considered what Tim had told him for a minute. Tell me more, he said. Tim nodded. He felt a little pity for the two men. Thomas had shaved their heads, written all over their faces, and given them a bit of a beating. When they saw me, it was as if they'd seen their savior. How did Thomas contact you? 
Alexander asked as he realized that something was wrong. Tim was impressed by the question. Do you remember an organization called Dark Watch? He asked. Alexander had a good memory. Weapon design, right? Yes, Tim replied. They specialize in designing top weapons and selling the blueprints of their designs. The owner keeps a low profile. I was collecting evidence, and this organization sent people to find me. Tim paused for a moment before continuing. They said that someone wanted to provide a witness. When I reached the agreed location, I met with Thomas. It seems that he holds quite a high position in the organization. Alexander nodded seriously and asked, What did Thomas say? Tim looked at Alexander with a troubled look and hesitated. Do you really want to hear it? he asked. Glancing at the kitchen, Alexander nodded at Tim and bid him to continue. Thomas said that you're useless. He said you're not a good husband and that you scare your wife. Tim had not actually repeated what Thomas had said exactly, because he knew that Alexander would be outraged if he repeated the exact words. Alexander guessed that Thomas's original words would have been much more provocative. He looked at the slim figure in the kitchen, and all kinds of emotions surged through him. Sir, Mrs. Brown doesn't know about your plan. She's very calm. What about Missy? Even without Thomas, Missy wouldn't be in trouble. Alexander had already arranged for someone to secretly protect her. He knew that if she had been kidnapped by anyone, the bodyguards would have been there to help her immediately. After a while, Samantha came out of the kitchen with a tray. There were three bowls of food on it. Let me do that, Tim said, jumping up when he saw her carrying the tray. Putting it down on the table, he asked nervously, Why are there three bowls? One's for you. Aren't you hungry? asked Samantha. Just as she finished speaking, Tim felt a gaze as cold as ice sweep over him. He had heard Noah complain about Alexander before and how he was overprotective of his wife and food. He especially didn't like others having the opportunity to eat Samantha's cooking. Oh, Mrs. Brown, you're too nice. I'm not very hungry, but thank you, said Tim quickly. The food smelled delicious, and he was, in fact, very hungry. What if you're hungry soon? You'll be going to the court with me and the police station later. There'll be no time to eat, Samantha said. As she spoke, she served Alexander and then turned back to Tim. Tim, you can eat it. My cooking isn't bad, I promise. Tim felt conflicted and didn't know what to do. He was finding it difficult to refuse Samantha's hospitality, and he looked to his boss for help and instructions. Take it into the kitchen and eat, Alexander said irritably. Thank you, Tim said. Then he snatched up the bowl and quickly exited the room. What is this? asked Alexander with an unsatisfied expression. He was poking around in the bowl as though it was poison. Samantha explained the dish, and then looked at Alexander in surprise. Have you never eaten it before? she asked. I heard Missy say that she'd tried it before, but she likes junk food, replied Alexander. Samantha began to feel annoyed at his behavior. She watched him take a bite. It was clear to her that he thought it was delicious, and she smiled to herself. Alexander couldn't help but raise his eyebrows. Samantha pretended to be busy eating and didn't notice that Alexander was watching her out of the corner of his eye. As Alexander watched Samantha, there were small signs that indicated her mood had brightened. She took her time and savored every mouthful, and every so often she would raise her eyebrows in pleasure. He didn't like how Samantha looked when she was unhappy. He wanted her to always be happy, and he liked the way she smiled. He had seen how Samantha had smiled at David, and he had seen her smile lovingly at her brother. He had also seen her at work, on a podium, where her smile was confident and powerful. He thought about how she smiled at him. Sometimes she seemed helpless, and other times she seemed grateful. There were even occasions where she seemed happy. When he thought of the specific scenarios where she had smiled at him, he began to replay them in his mind. He wanted to hide her away and keep her to himself.
Tim had finished the bowl of food that Samantha had prepared for him, and it had been so delicious that he heaved a long sigh of relief. He finally understood why Alexander and the doctor would repeatedly use Samantha's cooking to provoke Noah. As he had enjoyed the meal so much, he decided to provoke Jack by telling him all about it. He sent Jack a picture of the empty bowl. Within a few seconds, Tim could see that Jack was typing a reply. When it arrived, it said, Begging for food? Don't you have money? Tim rolled his eyes and quickly typed out a reply, explaining that Samantha had cooked for him. He made sure to tell Jack that the meal had been delicious. Almost instantly, Jack's reply came through. That was cooked by Mrs. Brown and the boss didn't shoot you? Tim laughed out loud before replying. The boss was fine with it. It was so good. He hit send and then thought of something else to say to really wind Jack up. But when he hit send, the message failed. Tim checked his phone and a system notification popped up saying that his message couldn't be delivered. He's blocked me. Ha! <laughs> Jack must be about to explode with anger, thought Tim with a smirk. When Alexander and Samantha arrived at the police station, Brady and Mia were sitting in the waiting room. Albert was still giving a statement, and the door of the office was closed. Through the glass of the room next door, they could see that Lily was answering questions with a sneer on her face. In another room, there was a man in his early 40s who was being interrogated by two police officers. After they had been there for more than an hour, one of the investigation team's officers came over to them. We're close to confirming that Lily Miller was one of the killers, she said solemnly. Samantha was shocked, and both Brady and Mia looked at each other, completely stunned. All three were silently asking the same question. How could it be Lily? Albert, who had finished giving his statement, said bitterly, Brady, Mia, I've let you down. If I hadn't taken Lily to my father's birthday, this wouldn't have happened. The two Jackson siblings didn't want to respond to Albert's words. They avoided eye contact with him, while Alexander glanced at Albert with obvious scorn. The police officer said, The man in the interrogation room will also be charged. He was a new employee at Brown Mansion. He and Lily had previously had a sexual relationship, and he became obsessed with her. As a result, we all know about the dispute between Lily and the deceased, and he acted on her behalf. He was the one to actually throw the deceased down the stairs. He is the real murderer. Everyone looked at the officer, urging her to provide more information. Samantha asked, So how was Lily involved? Lily has been interviewed. Although she didn't cooperate fully with the investigation, in the end, she admitted her involvement. As for the false charges against Mr. Brown, she stated that was because of a personal grudge between the two of you. The officer said, turning to face Alexander. Mr. Brown, can I confirm that you have a serious personal grudge against the suspect? She asked. Alexander looked at her coldly. I guess, he answered. Judging by all this information, the suspect may be convicted as an accomplice. The final result will depend on the court, said the officer. As she finished speaking, both Lily and the man charged with murder were escorted through the waiting room by three police officers. The man was handcuffed, and his expression was blank and with no sign of any resistance or regret. Alexander noticed that his gaze paused on Albert for a moment. I'll beat you to death! You killed my mom! yelled Brady as he lunged towards the man and began to kick and punch him. The police officers didn't do anything to stop Brady's attack. They just continued to drag the man along with them. Lily, why would you do this? Mia asked as tears rolled down her face. I treated you so well, and my mother treated you like a daughter-in-law. Why did you kill her? Why? Lily laughed out loud. She looked at Mia and said, Really? Her originally beautiful face had changed, and it looked haggard. Mia, you were only nice to me because I looked after you. Then, Lily pointed at Brady. Mia, Brady just wanted to have sex with other women every few days when he was supposed to be with me. He's a hypocrite, and even brought his pregnant mistress along to humiliate me. And your mother, well, that mother of yours didn't like me at all. She just thought I could be a pretty daughter-in-law and serve her interests. 
Lily took a deep breath as she finished her outburst. Mia was shocked by Lily's lack of remorse, and she shook her head and cried again. And you! Lily turned and looked at Samantha with hatred in her eyes. Sam, are you happy and proud now? Not only did Alex get away with the crime, but he also told the world that you're Mrs. Brown. You have a strong and handsome husband, and you have a bright future. Samantha frowned. She wasn't happy about her marriage being made public. In her opinion, Alexander had been provoked by David and the situation, especially when the reporters all thought she was in a relationship with David. He had acted on his possessive nature and jealousy. Lily was furious, and she had come to the realization that she had lost. In a moment of desperation, she broke free from the police officer's grip and took a step towards Samantha. Sam! she exclaimed. As Samantha turned to her sister, there was a metallic sound and a glint of a metal blade in front of her. At the same time, with a clang, a knife fell to the floor, and Samantha was trying to figure out what had happened. A few seconds later, bright red blood appeared on Alexander's clothes. Alex! Samantha was shocked. She nervously held Alexander's arm, wanting to check his wound. She couldn't believe how fast he had reacted. If he hadn't, it would have been me who was stabbed, thought Samantha. Alexander stepped forward and covered the wound with his other hand. I'm fine, he said. The police officers quickly controlled Lily and apologized to Alexander and Samantha. They looked anxious and knew that it was because of their negligence that Alexander was injured. No one had thought that Lily would have a hidden weapon, and they hadn't searched her. Two more police officers appeared and handcuffed Lily. They quickly started to drag her towards the holding cells. And as she was being led away, Lily remembered what Albert had said to her before she had ended up there. I'll give you two options. One, do as I say and I'll let you live. Two, if you don't listen to me, I'll make you wish you were dead. Mr. Brown, please come over here. We can take a look at that wound, said another officer who had brought out a medical kit. Okay, agreed Alexander. He gestured to an empty room and said to another police officer, Please protect my wife. No problem, Mr. Brown, answered the officer. Alex, don't worry, I'll come with you, Samantha said. No, wait here, he insisted. Mia was still crying as if her heart was broken. Brady sat next to her, and he rubbed between his eyebrows in frustration and regret. He didn't have the energy to console his sister. In the other room, Alexander took off his coat so that the officer could inspect the wound. After taking a close look, the officer heaved a sigh of relief and said, Mr. Brown, it's okay. It's very shallow. I can just wrap it with a thin gauze. You'll probably have a scab by tomorrow. Wrap it thicker, Alexander said firmly. Confused, the police officer looked at him and hesitated. I told you to make it thicker, said Alexander. The officer was puzzled for a moment, but then quickly understood what Alexander meant. He dressed the wound more. Alexander nodded his head in satisfaction. Is it serious, Alex? asked Samantha. As her husband emerged from the room, she immediately rushed over to him and offered him her arm. Jack had gone to the car to get some spare clothes for Alexander to change into, no matter where or when, he wouldn't be seen to be sloppy. Brady gloomily looked at Samantha. In the past, when the two of them had been together, he had never seen her care so much about him, and it filled him with sadness. It's not too bad, Alexander said, and he raised his arm to let Samantha see the thick layer of gauze. It'll be fine in a few days, he assured her. Does it hurt? It must, Samantha said. She couldn't help but feel sorry for him, and her heart ached. The awkwardness between them from before was long gone. Alexander took the opportunity to kiss Samantha's forehead. He was in a good mood, and he was pleased that Samantha was so concerned about him. After finishing the relevant reports and procedures, the group left the police station together. Albert couldn't stand a look at Alexander's cold face. His smile was somewhat forced when he said, Alex, I've wronged you this time, but you should know that Dad has already promised to give me the position of the head of the family. Congratulations, 
Alexander said with obvious disdain. He wasn't concerned about the title of the head of the family. It was power and wealth that mattered to Alexander the most, and he planned to make sure that Albert's title was only temporary. Albert, shouldn't my mom's shares in the brown... Brady began. He was concerned about the Jacksons' precarious financial situation. His future was entirely dependent on inheriting Lorraine's assets. Your mother's shares have been taken back by the company. The board of directors... I will manage it on your behalf, said Albert apologetically. Brady, this is something that can't be helped. Lorraine was from the Brown family, and your surname is Jackson. You're from the Jackson family. There's no reason for you to inherit Brown's property. However, the entire Jackson estate belongs to you and Mia. Brady's jaw dropped. The entire Jackson estate? There's only a mess left for the Jacksons, he thought. Brady's shock gradually turned into hatred. He raised his voice slightly and said, Albert, when my mom was alive, she promised to give the shares to Mia and me. Grandpa also agreed to it. I really didn't know about that, said Albert as he shook his head. But if you can find evidence, I'll transfer them to you. Everyone is tired today. Let's go home and rest. Albert didn't want to stay any longer, so he turned on his heel and left without giving Brady a chance to reply. Brady looked at Mia with outrage in his eyes. He knew he had no evidence to give to Albert. His mother was dead, and his grandfather was imprisoned. How can I, with no power or influence, find evidence? He wondered, before collapsing into a chair. Mia's eyes were swollen from crying, and she let out the odd sob. She wanted to comfort her brother, but she didn't feel like she had the strength. Mrs. Brown, let's go home. Alexander urged Samantha as he hugged her waist. As he guided her out of the police station, Samantha took one last look around and was filled with suspicion. She had a nagging feeling that something wasn't quite right and that the whole truth hadn't been revealed. Alexander wanted to take a shower when he got home. He had just taken off his clothes when he opened the bathroom door and said Samantha's name. Hmm? Samantha was just about to go downstairs and cook. She turned around and frowned. I thought you were having a shower. What are you doing out here? Can you put on some clothes? She said, and she averted her eyes. Alexander lazily leaned against the bathroom door frame and saw her slightly red earlobes. He smiled and said, Mrs. Brown, why are you blushing? You've seen and touched me before. What is there to be embarrassed about? Alex, you... Samantha bit her bottom lip and hesitated. How can he be so shameless? She wondered. What exactly are you trying to do? Samantha asked, somewhat flustered and exasperated. Will you help me take a bath? My wound can't get wet. Alexander said with an innocent look on his face. Samantha didn't want to give him a bath, and she knew what he was trying to do. The wound is on your arm, Alex. You can manage to keep it dry. I'm going downstairs to cook, she said calmly. Alexander replied almost immediately. Ask the maid to cook instead. Come and take a bath with me. Are your intolerances cured? Samantha asked with wide eyes. She immediately regretted her question when she saw Alexander narrow his eyes. Samantha explained, You have a kind of illness, and I just want to help you get better. When your illness is cured, I'll be happy for you. Alexander sized her up for a few moments before he said, Other people can cook healthy food, Sam, not just you. If you don't come in with me, I'll catch a cold. Samantha knew there was no point trying to fight him. He was too good at lying and manipulating a situation. She picked up the telephone and dialed the internal line to let the kitchen know that they needed to prepare some food. When Samantha looked at the bandage wrapped around Alexander's left arm, she felt guilty, and her heart sank. Does it hurt? Samantha asked. She was about to touch Alexander's wound, but then she thought better of it. She didn't want to hurt him. It's okay, it's not too bad, he said. He was going to say yes and play it up, but he didn't want her to get too worried. She tried to put aside her distracting thoughts and focus on what she was doing. 
but she was having a hard time concentrating with him watching her. Can you close your eyes? she asked. He was staring at her intently, and it was making her uncomfortable. You know, if you do a good job, maybe I'll keep you on bath duty permanently, he said with a grin. I wouldn't mind having you give me a bath every day. You'd like that, wouldn't you? She thought angrily. That's never going to happen. She took a deep breath and thought, I can't get upset. The reason he's hurt is because of me. After getting out of the tub, he asked her to help him get dressed, saying that he didn't want to tear his wound open. He didn't tear it open when he took his clothes off, she thought. But she didn't want to argue with him because she knew it was useless, so she went to get him a bathrobe. Alexander was enjoying having Samantha dress him. Her fingers were slender and delicate, and she swiftly and gracefully tied the belt of his bathrobe around his waist. He lowered his eyes to her and saw that she had a serious look on her face. Then he bent down and kissed her. Before leaving the bathroom, he looked at himself in the mirror. His bathrobe was very neatly arranged, with the collar folded down and the belt tied in a perfect knot. It was the first time he had seen himself look so pristine in a bathrobe. Usually, he threw it on casually over his pajamas, and it was rarely tied up. He smiled at his reflection, and his eyes were full of love. After dinner, Samantha went to the garden for a walk. Then, she returned to the master bedroom to wait for Alexander. He had done little work that day, dealing with only the most urgent matters. He came back from his office and opened the door to the master bedroom. There, he saw Samantha sitting in the armchair beside the window. She was quietly reflecting on something, and it looked to Alexander as if time had stood still for a moment. Outside the floor-to-ceiling window in the master bedroom, there was a lake that could be seen in the distance. That night, the air was calm, and Samantha could see the waves on the lake sparkling with the reflection of the bright moonlight. Alex, I think we need to talk she said when she heard him come in. He raised his eyebrows slightly. Talk about what? he asked. He had known for a while that there was something on Samantha's mind. He had been waiting for her to tell him for a long time. He walked over and got her to stand up so he could sit underneath her with her in his lap. He put his arms around her. Samantha felt uncomfortable sitting on his lap and struggled to get off, but he held her waist firmly. He started twirling the tips of her hair with his fingertips, waiting for her to speak. Alexander, Samantha said, calling him by his full name. She looked again at the calm lake outside and said, I don't like how I feel right now. How do you feel? He asked with a frown. I feel like I'm out of the loop, she replied. She had repeated those words many times in her head, practicing for that moment. You plan to hide this whole thing from me from the beginning to end. You weren't going to say a single word to me about it. I feel... She trailed off, not able to say the word out loud. I feel isolated, she thought. Feel what? He asked. I feel like I'm not your wife, she said, looking at him sincerely. Alex, maybe you think I'm not strong enough to handle the truth. Or maybe you think that I'm stupid and useless, but I'm not... And I'm tired of you making me feel that way. I don't want to be ignorant of what's going on. You're my husband. Whatever's happening in your life affects me too. Alexander's heart tightened. Does she really think I don't consider her strong or smart? He thought. She took care of everything while I was gone, including protecting Missy. How could I think she was useless? I was just protecting her, he thought. She's my everything. Sam, he said hugging her tightly and placing his chin on her shoulder. He breathed in her sweet scent. You're my wife. I don't think any of those things about you. She blinked at him. His words didn't do much to comfort her. Yes, I'm his wife, she thought. But what's the difference between being his wife and being any other woman when he doesn't even trust me with his plans? She didn't like to be kept in the dark, and she hated the anxiety that came with being helpless. He had made her feel worthless and unnecessary. Alexander sighed, feeling somewhat helpless himself. He could tell that she was still unhappy, and he didn't know what to say or do to fix things. 
He wasn't very good at making people feel better when they were upset. When he thought about how he would feel if Samantha left him out of her plans, he felt an irrepressible sense of rejection and sadness. He pulled the collar of his bathrobe with his free hand. It had started to make him feel a little suffocated. He thought back to when Samantha had gone, as quickly as she could, to the police station, bringing him food and trying to persuade him to tell the police the truth. The memory brought tears to his eyes. He finally said, Okay, you want to know everything? The murderer isn't Lily. It's Albert. He decided that would be a good place to start. It was an indication that he was willing to let her in on what he knew. She didn't look particularly shocked. She thought that it made sense and had considered it before as a possibility. I thought so. I knew that what Lily said wasn't the truth, she said. But why is she willing to take the blame for Albert? And what about that worker? Oh, look at you, figuring it out for yourself, he said, smiling and kissing her on the lips. See, you're very smart. Then he continued. The worker was easy to pay off. He owes a lot of money in gambling debt, so Albert paid back what he owed and gave him another chunk of money to work for him personally. The worker has a wife and daughter and needed the money desperately. As for Lily, Albert had many ways to threaten her. But why haven't you exposed Albert? Samantha asked. She still didn't fully understand. Alex doesn't think very highly of Albert, she thought. There's no reason for him to help Albert get away with this crime. What do you think? He asked, looking at her intently. She began to carefully think about the situation and the relationships between all of the people involved. You're letting Lily take the blame because everyone already thinks she's guilty and because it would hurt Mia and Brady the most? Samantha guessed. As soon as she said it, she felt that it wasn't right. She started thinking out loud. But now that Albert is free and clear, he'll get the whole Brown family fortune. And you're not going to let him do that, are you? Although Alex didn't have any feelings for the Brown family, she thought, the fact that he hasn't attacked their business since establishing Blue Whale Enterprises means that he probably doesn't want to destroy them completely. And if he doesn't want to destroy the family business, he wouldn't have been willing to give it to someone who doesn't deserve it. Right again, two for two. Alexander said, pinching her chin. Then he said suggestively, If you give me a kiss, I'll tell you everything I know. He had never realized before how much his mood was affected by Samantha. When she was down, he felt dark clouds over him. And when she was in a good mood, he brightened up as well. Samantha started to lean in to kiss him, but stopped herself just in time. Then she said with a serious face, if you don't tell me out of your own free will, it doesn't count. After saying that, she tried to get up off his lap. Okay, okay, come back, I'll tell you, he said, pulling her back down and kissing her a few more times. I want to leave the Brown family fortune to Leonard, he said. After all, when Albert's done with all his messing around, there won't be anyone to take care of Leonard. When Leonard returns, he thought... I'm going to make Albert confess and pay for what he did. For now, I'll let him celebrate his victory and think that he's won. Then, he explained, if Albert is convicted of murder, Simon would most likely give all the shares from himself, Lorraine, and Albert to Brady. He paused and gave a look of disgust at the sound of Brady's name. But, he continued, if I make sure that Albert is safe and sound, Simon won't give him his own shares right away. He'll want to see first that Albert has the ability to keep me in check. Okay, go on, Samantha said, intrigued. In this way, Blue Whale Enterprises will slowly become the biggest shareholder and gain control over the Brown Corporation. Eric and Noah are already purchasing more shares. The Brown Corporation has many branches, and the director of those branches all have their eyes on Brady and the Jackson Empire. She nodded slowly, but didn't say anything. As for Lily, he added, she deserves everything she's getting, so I don't mind letting her take the fall for now. Samantha's mouth hung open, and she gave him a shocked look. She considered what he had said for a moment, and then she looked at him in admiration. She asked, have you been planning this from the moment that Lorraine died? 
he shook his head. Before that, he said. She was stunned. But how? she asked. Alexander was hesitant to say anything else. He didn't like to disclose a lot of information when it came to his plans. But when he saw Samantha's reaction, he changed his mind. He enjoyed the way she was looking at him with awe and admiration. It filled him with pride, and he couldn't move his eyes away from her. It all began with the dagger I gave Simon. It made him feel guilty about what he had done and prompted him to agree to Lorraine's request to split the family fortune, which made Albert angry. He looked out the window and said, Lorraine was arrogant. She's always looked down on Albert, ever since they were kids. All it took was for Lorraine to open her mouth at just the right moment for Albert to finally snap. Alexander had used Albert to get Lorraine out of the picture. The matter of the dagger drew out old secrets and hostility between the two of them, and he had guessed that it would end in Lorraine's murder. Alexander continued, I also knew that either Albert or Lily would be blamed for her death because Albert had so much control over Lily. I figured it would only be a matter of time before the Jackson family collapsed and the Brown Corporation would take the opportunity to nibble away at its remaining market shares. Then, once in the hands of Albert, the Brown Corporation would eventually fall into the hands of myself and Leonard. Alex, you're evil, Samantha said after she had heard everything. She couldn't believe that he had come up with such an ingenious plan. He pinched her cheeks and said, smiling, So you shouldn't cross me. I'm an evil genius. She rolled her eyes at him and smiled back. Are you done throwing a tantrum? He asked. I wasn't throwing a tantrum, she said, punching him in the shoulder gently. He retaliated by tickling her because he knew how much she hated it. She laughed and tried to struggle free, but he held her down, amused by her screams and laughter. Then he wrapped his arms around her waist and changed their positions so that he was slightly on top of her. He started to kiss her tenderly. He had one hand on the armchair and held the back of Samantha's head with the other. Then... Suddenly, Samantha felt her body lighten as he picked her up and threw her onto the bed. He pressed himself on top of her, kissing her passionately. What about your injury? she asked, pushing him away. It's fine, he answered, lowering his head to kiss her again. The next day, the media exploded with all kinds of shocking news. The business world, the fashion industry, and the people on social media were all talking about the news that had been released. It was all part of Alexander's plan. He had people in control of what would be sent to the press, and when everything had finally been settled in court, he had released the news all at once, not giving anyone the opportunity to deny any part of it. Samantha looked at her phone and read some of the headlines from the major news websites. The return of business genius Alexander Brown. Lily Miller guilty of murder. Samantha Miller married to business tycoon Alexander Brown. Alexander Brown found not guilty. Alexander, king of the Browns. The last headline was at the top of the list of trending topics for the day. Jack had negotiated with the reporters ahead of time, telling them that Alexander's appearance couldn't be made public. They were both given two photos that had already been prepared. One was a frontal view, and the other was a side profile. They caused a huge sensation online. The photos were of Alexander from when he had been young. He had always been handsome, because both his mother and Simon were very good-looking. Comments on social media came pouring in. The Brown family must have a gene for killing. How many of them are murderers? How could Samantha Miller have kept this a secret for so long? She just better watch out. Now that we've seen Alexander's face, someone might snatch him up. What a hunk! She's got a beautiful diamond ring, a luxury car, and limited edition clothes. Even if someone takes him, she's still done pretty well for herself. The rich and famous really are scary. How many other secrets like this are they hiding? Unfortunately, I'll probably never be rich enough to find out. No wonder Samantha's career has been so smooth. Look who she's got supporting her. So what if she has a husband supporting her? She's still a big success. But where did he get his money from? That's what I want to know. Secrets of the wealthy class run pretty deep. You probably don't want to know.
Their names were all over the internet. Samantha scrolled down and read more of the trending topics for the day. Alexander Brown wore a mask to save the world from his beauty. First published photo of Alexander Brown. Why are there no more photos of Mr. Brown? The fiancé that killed her mother-in-law. As a result, the value of shares in the businesses of both the Browns and Millers dropped substantially, and Jackson Enterprise was forced to declare bankruptcy. Alexander walked to Samantha's side. She looked at her phone intently, and he wanted to see what she was looking at. He was surprised by a message on her social media account that he read over her shoulder. The real question is, how did someone like Samantha Miller get a man like Alexander Brown? The message had become a trending topic. Sam, he said, making Samantha jump. She didn't know he was standing behind her, and she was surprised by the sound of his voice. What are you looking at? he asked, snatching her phone and clicking on the post. He read the comments underneath. Some people commented that Samantha had drugged him, and others said that she was carrying his child and had forced him to marry her. There were other comments saying that Samantha and Simon had been working together. Why are you looking at this garbage? He asked, throwing the phone down on the table. It's all nonsense. His expression was dark and cold as if he had taken their comments personally. He immediately called Jack and ordered him to find a way to have the comments removed. Alex, forget it, Samantha said, trying to calm him down. Well, what was it? He asked, annoyed. Did you drug me, or did I get you pregnant? Since when does Alexander Brown get so worked up over a little gossip? She asked, teasing him. The comments had gotten her attention, too, because she had been wondering the same thing ever since the trial. Actually, I was thinking about it long before they said it, she said. I've been asking myself the same question since the first time I saw you. He paused and asked, What do you mean by that? She thought for a moment to search for the right words to say. Then she explained, Alex, we can't choose the families we're born into. There's a gap between us that was formed many years ago. We'll never be the same level, you and I. Then she took his hand and continued, But your wealth and status won't scare me away. I'll say the same thing that I've said before. I won't give up on our marriage unless you do first. But, she thought, there will always be a divide between us. He looked at her closely and said, Mrs. Brown, I'm not sure that I believe you a hundred percent. You don't look entirely convinced. He thought that the people on social media had gotten inside her head. She looked at him silently, feeling a little guilty because she had backed away from their marriage once before. Change your clothes. We're going out, he said. Uh, okay. Where are we going? She asked, confused and curious. Alexander didn't ask anyone to drive them. He took the car himself. Along the way, he stopped at a flower shop to buy a bunch of lilies. When they arrived at Brown Mansion, Samantha guessed where they were going. Are we going to see your mother? She asked. He nodded. When they reached a man-made lake, they couldn't go any further by car, they had to get out of the car and walk. He parked the car at the side of the road and took Samantha's hand in his as he led her along the path. In Samantha's other hand, she was carrying the bouquet of flowers. She looked at their tightly clenched hands, and for a short time, she felt like she was in a daze. Alexander liked holding her hand when they walked. He thought it was sweet and made them look like a young couple in love. When passing by an impressive-looking mausoleum, Samantha asked, Is this it? Alexander kept walking, not saying a word. They walked another hundred meters and finally stopped in front of a small chapel. This is where my mother is buried, he said. He glanced at the Brown family's cemetery not far away. That's the cemetery of the Browns. My mother didn't like the depressing feeling that she got there when she was alive. She was quite religious, so I asked someone to build her this chapel instead. Alexander felt like it would have been an insult to have his mother buried with the Brown family, considering that he was sure Simon was responsible for her death. And he was glad he had made that choice. 
They had since buried Victoria there, and Lorraine was about to be buried there too. He didn't feel like she belonged with them. Back then, he had also felt that his mother wouldn't want to see Lorraine, Albert, and the other children wandering around in front of her grave when they were visiting their other relatives. The chapel wasn't very big, and he thought that it suited her. Although Amelia had been a wealthy woman, she didn't like to show it off. After passing through the chapel, they reached a garden on the other side. It was winter, and the flowers were all dead. But Samantha could imagine what it would look like in the spring with flowers blossoming everywhere. Amelia's grave was there in the garden. The tombstone had a picture of Amelia on it from when she was young. She had gentle eyes and well-defined facial features. She was so beautiful that it was hard for Samantha to look away. Alex looks like his mother in a lot of ways, she thought. Mom, I brought someone to see you, Alexander said, his voice tender and loving. Samantha placed the lilies in front of the tombstone and said, Miss Mitchell, it's an honor to finally meet you. Alexander looked at Samantha with a scowl. She was confused. Why is he looking at me like that? She thought. He held her hand again and said to his mother, This is your daughter-in-law. We're married, so she doesn't need to call you Miss Mitchell. She can call you Mom. Samantha almost choked. She wasn't angry, but she was a little taken aback by the way he was speaking to her. Hello, Mom. My name's Samantha, she said, introducing herself again. Alexander was satisfied. He usually didn't speak much when he paid his respects to his mother. He would usually just take a bunch of fresh flowers and clean the gravestone and chapel. But it was a special day with Samantha there, so he said a few more words. His mother had died young, so Alexander hadn't gotten to know her very well. When she had been alive, she had spent most of her time and energy on Simon. He felt that his mother would most likely be hurt that he had sent Simon to prison. But he was okay with that. As they were driving away, they encountered a car in which Albert was sitting along with some other relatives. Albert rolled down the window and said, Alex, why didn't you say that you were coming here today? Albert had taken over the position of the head of the Brown family, and he was enjoying his new role. But to Alexander, who didn't consider himself a part of the Brown family, Albert's position meant nothing. Congratulations on having your wish come true, Alexander said. I hope you won't let the Brown family go downhill. Then he looked at the other relatives meaningfully and drove away. One of them sighed and said, What a pity. If Alex was in charge of the Brown Corporation, he would be able to solve the current problem. What are you talking about? Albert asked, giving him a dirty look. The man quickly smiled and added, but with you leading the company, Albert, I'm sure everything will turn out okay. Albert frowned as he thought, Alex hasn't contributed to this family for ten years. Why does everyone still think he's so smart? His unexpected meeting with Alexander had left him feeling bitter and resentful. Alex wants me to take care of the family business because he wants to just sit back and enjoy the benefits, he thought. Little did he know that Blue Whale Enterprises had already bought nearly half of Brown Corporation's shares and owned a bigger part of the company than Albert did. And, as the CEO of Blue Whale Enterprises, Alexander had a lot more control than Albert realized. Alex, does Albert know that you're the CEO of Blue Whale Enterprises? Samantha asked. I expect he knows I have connections there, he said. The number of people who knew that Alexander was the CEO could be counted on one hand. He had been very careful not to expose that information. Samantha felt a bit sorry for Albert. He had worked so hard to put together his plan, but in the end, he was just being manipulated by Alexander. Alex, let's go to the mall. I'll buy you the cufflinks I promised, she said, suddenly remembering what she had said to Alexander at the police station. He had kept his promise to her and taken her to see his mother, so she felt it was only right to keep her promise to him and buy him some cufflinks. They stopped at a red light. Sam, I'm glad you've seen my mother, he said. Me too, she replied. 
Jackson Enterprises went bankrupt and owed tens of millions of dollars in debt. The people who had always fawned over Mia and Brady started distancing themselves from them, and people who had once called Brady a friend disappeared without a trace. All of the Jacksons' luxury cars, antiques, and properties were auctioned off. Everything of value in their mansion was taken away piece by piece. Mia was frantically chasing people around the house, trying to get her things back. No, that dressing table is my favorite. It's an antique. You can't take it away, she cried. Do you know what I had to go through to get that purse? Get your hands off it. You there, don't touch my jewelry. Her cries filled Brady's ears. She was giving him a headache. He felt like his whole world was about to collapse. His grandfather had just been convicted of murder, and his mother had been killed. And the only thing Mia could do was cry. Tens of millions of dollars would have meant nothing to him in the past, but at that moment, it was a huge sum of money that he had no hope of paying back. At the moment, they were having problems just finding enough money to eat and stay in their home. When Brady felt like his life couldn't get any more depressing, he thought of Isabel. He called her number twice before she finally answered the phone. Isabel, you finally picked up! I have an idea. Let's run away together, Brady said excitedly. He seemed to think that he had found the solution to all of his problems. If you sell off the house and the car I gave you, we can go live somewhere tropical, just you and me. Well, you, me, and our baby. The three of us can have a good life together, far away from here. He thought that as long as he could get out of the country, he wouldn't have to deal with the debt. Brady, our child is gone, Isabel said in a calm and emotionless voice. What did you say? Brady asked, confused. He wasn't sure if he heard her correctly. Brady, I lost the child, Isabel said again. I couldn't bring a child into this world with a father who's so far in debt. I've already sold the house and the car, but the money's mine. Goodbye, Brady. Don't call me again. When the phone went silent, Brady felt like he had lost everything. Isabel's gone, he thought. She was only with me for my money. She never loved me. His last hope had extinguished, and he fell to the ground in despair. I have nothing now, he thought. I have only debt, millions of dollars of debt. He recalled what Albert had said to him once. Albert told me we'd inherit the Jackson family fortune, he thought. What fortune? That night, Brady went to a bar to get drunk. He entered a dive of a bar, like the ones he used to make fun of, and he drank the cheapest liquor they had. He drank until he didn't know his own name. It felt good to be numb and to forget about his problems for a brief moment. After a while, he couldn't afford to go on. He paid for his tab with the last of his money and stumbled out of the bar. A group of men watched him as he stumbled onto the sidewalk. Hey, where are you going? One of the men asked, walking toward him. Get out of the way, Brady slurred angrily. Or you'll do what, Brady? The man asked. How do you know my name? Brady asked, looking at them suspiciously with half-closed eyes. One of the men threw a punch at Brady and knocked him to the ground. His nose started to bleed, and when the cold winter air hit it, it sobered him up a little. Get lost! Don't touch me! Do you know who I am? Let go of me! He screamed. Oh, we know who you are, one of the men said as he stood Brady up and held his arms behind his back. A lost little puppy without a home. The men kept laughing as they started to punch Brady again and again. David was standing not far away with Tara by his side. They both watched quietly with calm expressions on their faces. Tara was holding a woman who was tied up. It was Mia. Her mouth was sealed with tape and she couldn't move. She was being forced to watch her own brother get beaten to a bloody pulp. They were close enough that Mia could get a look at what was happening. She was so shocked that her eyes were wide open and tears were flowing down her cheeks. She wanted to call out to him and help her brother, but she couldn't. She closed her eyes, not able to watch anymore. But as soon as she did, her hair was pulled so hard that she felt like her scalp was going to be ripped off. She was forced to open her eyes and watch.
When Brady could no longer stand up by himself, and his face was bloody and bruised, the men finally stopped beating him and let him drop to the ground. They silently disappeared into the alley. Brady tried to get up and twisted around for a while in pain, and then he simply lay on the ground, not moving. The night turned quiet. The sound of the men's insults and Brady's cries had finally stopped. Mia closed her eyes in despair. That night was the first snowfall of the year in Springfield. In the morning, someone found the corpse of a man in a small alley. It was Brady. Later on, someone reported that they had seen a woman the night before, crying hysterically not far away. She looked like Mia Jackson, but they weren't sure if it was her. Another person came forward and confirmed that it had been Mia. Some reporters got hold of the story and took some pictures that they posted online of Mia looking miserable. The story was all over the internet within a short time. The debt owed by the Jackson family was suddenly forgiven as the debtor had mysteriously and unexpectedly died. The collapse of the Jackson family became the new topic of gossip. Samantha had been receiving calls of consolation from various friends, but some of the calls she was getting were from people who had only worked with her once or twice. They were taking advantage of the opportunity to call and ask questions about Alexander. Samantha politely responded to them one by one, but they were starting to make her very anxious. Then, Zoe called to ask how she was doing. Have you finished taking care of everything you needed to deal with? She asked. Yes, everything's settled, Samantha answered. I think it's time for me to get back to work. Then let's start again the day after tomorrow. I have something lined up for you, Zoe said. She told her all the details about the time and place. Samantha wrote down all the information and said gratefully, Zoe, thank you. Thank you for what? Zoe asked, half amused. Thanks for getting Tara to protect me. And thank you for treating me like I'm my own person, separate from my husband, Samantha said sincerely. Sam, you are a person apart from your husband. You're you, Zoe said in a reassuring voice. Perhaps some only see you as his wife, but in my eyes, you're my star model. And aside from that, I consider you a friend. The dust was finally starting to settle for Alexander and Samantha. Though the outside world was still talking about the latest news, life was starting to return to normal for those at the heart of the stories. Samantha realized that she had forgotten about something. She hadn't talked to her brother since she had told him to take care of Missy. She called Thomas and asked him to take Missy to Rock Hill Manor to have dinner together that evening. She wanted Missy to see that Alexander was okay so that she would calm down. She started preparing the meal early in the morning. She planned to make all the dishes that were Thomas's favorites. When Alexander returned home from work, he smelled something delicious. He went to the kitchen to see what it was and saw a stew with big chunks of vegetables and mushrooms simmering in a rich broth with red wine. It wasn't a dish that Samantha typically cooked. He looked around, but Samantha wasn't there. She must have stepped out of the kitchen for a moment, he thought. Jim took his coat and saw the look of doubt on his face. He explained, Mrs. Brown is making a beef stew, and she's also planning to make roast lamb and sweet potatoes. In a short time, her brother and Miss Mitchell will arrive for dinner. Alexander frowned and asked, Why are they coming over? Jim patiently explained, Sir, as I understand, Mrs. Brown had asked her brother to look after Miss Mitchell while you were away, so she naturally wants to thank him for doing so. She said that it's been so long since she last saw him that she would like to have him over for dinner. But more than anything, she wanted to let Miss Mitchell see, with her own eyes, that you're safe and sound. He could see that Alexander wasn't happy. It appears that Mrs. Brown didn't ask Mr. Brown first if they could come over for dinner, he realized. The more Jim thought about it, the more he was happy that Mrs. Brown was around. It's so nice to have such a kind person here to add some warmth to the house, he thought. Jim, do you know where Grandma is these days? 
Alexander asked, changing the topic. He had a serious look on his face. Jim guessed why he was asking. He had just put Simon in jail and wanted to find out what she thought about it. When Alexander had been young, his father hadn't loved him, and his mother had been too worried about getting her husband's affection to pay much attention to him. It was because of his grandmother, Anne Leonard, that his childhood hadn't been utterly miserable. Jim smiled and said calmly, Sir, please be assured that your grandmother knows what happened and that she won't say anything. Although she's hurt to see her son in prison, he broke her heart long ago, and you're her grandson, whom she loves very much. She understands that you did what you had to do. Hilda had loved Alexander's mother deeply and hadn't been happy to see Victoria take her place as Simon's wife. She felt that Simon had torn the family apart and she had long abandoned him as her son. He was part of the reason she had gone overseas. Say hello to Grandma for me the next time you speak with her and tell her to come back soon, Alexander said. I'd like for her to meet Sam. He gave Jim a nod of gratitude and walked back to the kitchen. Hilda had approved and even pushed his marriage to Samantha. To Alexander, it showed that she was satisfied with her and didn't need to concern herself with their relationship. Jim smiled and agreed. He could read Alexander like a book. Although Alexander respected and loved Hilda, he rarely talked to her. Leonard was the one who was closer to her. The feeling was mutual. Hilda didn't have as much to say to Alexander as she did to Leonard, but she was happy to chat with Jim when she called to get news about the family. When Samantha returned to the kitchen, she found Alexander already there. Alex, I invited Missy over. My brother's going to bring her, she said as she walked over. He crossed his arms in front of his chest and asked, Why do I get the feeling that all of the dishes you're making are your brother's favorites? She smiled mischievously and kissed him on the cheek. It's rare for Thomas to come here. Besides, you'll want to see Missy, Samantha said. Alexander frowned and looked at her in irritation. When their guests arrived, Samantha was surprised to hear Missy talking softly while Thomas sounded relaxed and at ease. She hadn't expected them to get on so well, but she was glad that they did. Missy bounded into the living room and looked for Alexander. Where is he? she asked. I need to tell him I'm being bullied. He went upstairs to change his clothes, Samantha told her, her brows furrowed. He'll be down shortly. It was routine for him to change out of his suit and take a shower after returning home from work. Thomas appeared a few moments later and treated Samantha to a bright smile when he saw her. Sam, he exclaimed. Missy turned to him and stared. He was usually so stern for someone his age, yet she could hear the excitement in his voice when he saw his sister. Are you a Gemini? Missy asked. Thomas didn't answer. Instead, he turned to look at Samantha and then back at Missy. Ignore her, Thomas replied. We get along great. We've even been playing computer games together. Missy was outraged. Mr. Miller, Miss Keaton, if you'd like to follow me, please, Jim said. There are snacks on the coffee table, and Mrs. Brown has cooked for you both. Really? Thomas said, smiling in surprise. He thanked Jim, and then turned to Samantha and asked, What did you make? All of your favorites, she told him proudly. Brilliant! Thomas exclaimed before he moved toward her and wrapped her in his arms. They were still in that position when Alexander walked into the room. He rolled his eyes as Thomas turned to look at him. Hello, Thomas said. You're free. Was it comfortable in prison? Samantha glared at Thomas, and then she squeezed his shoulder in warning. Watch your mouth, she told him. Thomas stuck out his tongue in a childish gesture. He didn't like Alexander, and he planned to make things difficult for him. When Alexander didn't take Thomas's words to heart, Samantha breathed a sigh of relief. But Thomas noticed that Alexander was eyeing him warily, and surmised that he had made the connection between him and his criminal organization. Missy turned to Alexander and asked, Are you sure you're all right? I'm fine, he replied curtly. 
Missy rushed to his side, pointed toward Thomas, standing indignantly next to his sister, and cried, He's been bullying me! He made me do all the housework, he didn't let me watch television or go online, and he was always making fun of me! Samantha turned to her brother with a questioning look. She wanted him to look after Missy, not bully her. It's not my fault, Thomas said, raising his hands. Her place was a mess. Why should I be the one to clean it up? And I didn't want her to watch television or go online in case she saw something she shouldn't. I play games with her to pass the time instead. It's not my fault she's not very good at them. Thomas winced when he thought of the time he had spent explaining how to play some of the games. You have a nerve saying that to me, Missy said through gritted teeth. She turned to Samantha in hopes that she would understand her plight. He chose a shooting game, but he was always the shooter. He'd make me hide, and then he wouldn't bother to come looking for me. He thinks he's so smart. Thomas could see how much she'd been angered by his dismissal. But she was new to computer games and had struggled to learn the basics. I'm sorry, Missy. I'll download a single-player game for you. Something with bubbles and fluffy characters for you to start with. Why, you... Missy began, her face going bright red with anger. She wanted to stomp her feet, but she stopped herself. Thomas, stop teasing her, Samantha said as she tried her best not to laugh. Come on, let's go and eat. Alexander decided it was a good idea to have Missy around. Thomas was too busy arguing with her to monopolize his sister. When Thomas opened his mouth to start arguing again, Samantha glared at him. Missy was astonished by the effect his sister had on him. She had thought it was the perfect opportunity to try to wind him up again. She was surprised when he didn't rise to the bait and obediently followed his sister out of the room. Alex, does Thomas have some sort of personality disorder? Missy whispered. He's an entirely different person in front of his sister. Alexander gave her an incredulous look. Did Thomas happen to call you stupid by any chance? He asked. Her eyes went wide, and she looked up at him. How did you know? She asked. It figures, Alexander muttered. The dishes were placed in front of them on the table. The meat's rich fragrances and vibrant vegetable colors made Missy salivate. Her eyes roamed the table, searching for something sweet. When she found nothing, she turned to Samantha and said, There's no cake? Thomas scowled and said, If you want pudding, perhaps you could try some of the dishes my sister kindly prepared first. Missy wanted to say something, but she stopped herself. She just wanted to eat. There might not be any cake, but she knew Samantha was a fantastic cook, and she was hungry. Missy watched as Alexander took the serving spoon and dug it into a bowl full of spicy vegetables. Alex, your food intolerance. You can't eat that, Samantha scolded. He knows that, she thought. Why does he insist on acting like a petulant child? Then why did you cook dishes I'm not allowed to eat? He asked with a frown. Do you want me to just sit and watch? It made Alexander hate Thomas even more. She had cooked food that her brother liked, and he would have to sit and watch him eat it. Missy, meanwhile, had been busy watching Samantha and Alexander interact. She couldn't believe that her cousin was listening to her. She tried to remember when someone else had been able to handle Alexander like his wife, and she couldn't think of anyone. What are you looking at? Thomas asked her, pulling her from her thoughts. I was just thinking about how pretty Samantha was, and wondering what happened to you, she replied. Throughout the meal, Thomas and Missy continued to wind each other up. Missy looked at Thomas and said, Why are you so shameless? She keeps calling me shameless, Thomas grumbled. I cooked for her, and when she awoke frightened in the middle of the night, I waited by her bed until she fell asleep again, and then went and slept on the couch. I'm not sure what else she expects of me. Thomas decided to take the opportunity to irritate Alexander. Sam, have you considered what'll happen to the Brown family after this scandal? 
You're an innocent party. It seems a shame for you to stay and be tarnished by association. Have you considered... Thomas was cut short by Alexander. I suggest you watch your mouth, child. Alexander interjected. Or I might be forced to consider your reputation and the people you surround yourself with. Thomas's eyes widened in surprise. He had no intention of revealing his identity in front of his sister. He wanted her to think of him as her innocent little brother for as long as possible. Alexander curled his lips in disdain. Samantha narrowed her eyes and looked between the two of them. She had no idea what they were talking about. Alex, what aren't you saying? Missy asked as she chewed on her lamb chop. She couldn't get over how good of a cook Samantha was. She was listening to them but concentrating on the food in front of her. Alexander gave Thomas a scornful look and said, Eat your food, child. Then get out of my house. Alex, his name is Thomas. Will you please use his name? Samantha said. Sam, he'll never see me as more than a child, Thomas said, feigning sadness and defeat. It suddenly dawned on Missy what Thomas had been insinuating. Thomas, were you suggesting that your sister divorce my cousin? She asked. Just because you think I'm stupid doesn't mean my cousin is. Why would you do that? Missy asked as she started to argue with Thomas again. Samantha rolled her eyes. She felt helpless listening to them, but she knew that it was their way of communicating. Although Missy complained that Thomas was constantly bullying her, it was evident to her that they got along well. Thomas and Alexander were a different story. After the meal, Samantha suggested that they go up to the study to discuss their differences. She knew it was a long shot, but she felt that she had to try, and she was surprised when they both agreed. Missy sat on the couch silently. From time to time, she looked up at Samantha. When the silence began to get uncomfortable, Samantha leaned forward and asked, Do you have something you'd like to say to me? Yes. I wanted to thank you. Thomas has been bullying me, but he also saved me. If it wasn't for him that night, I would have been kidnapped by Simon's men, Missy said. Samantha could tell by the shakiness in her voice that she still hadn't gotten over her narrow escape and was frightened. I'm glad you're both safe, Samantha replied. What happened that day? Thomas didn't tell me the whole story. I... I don't actually know, Missy said. When I woke up the next morning, I found two men tied up on the floor. Thomas had stripped them of their clothes and drawn on them. They were mortified. She looked up at Sam and shivered. Your brother certainly doesn't have your gentleness, Missy muttered. Samantha gave a small smile. Sam, if I'm going to need looking after again, isn't there someone else that can do it? Thomas and I just don't get along. Samantha didn't know whether to laugh or cry. I can't promise it won't be my brother. Few people know about your situation, and there are even fewer that I would trust to protect you. The only other person is my friend, Ava. If she were to take care of you, you would soon ask to have Thomas back, she told her. I've heard of Ava. She's beautiful, but no one messes with her. I heard she always is getting into fights when she was younger. Missy said with a mixture of envy and disapproval. Samantha laughed and said, I'm afraid that's all true. I can't believe you two are friends, Missy exclaimed. Samantha noticed that Missy was starting to warm to her and seemed to have let go of her animosity. She hoped it would be the beginning of a better relationship. In the study on Alexander's desk sat a small decorative pistol. That looks familiar, Thomas said as he reached to pick it up. Alexander watched him closely as he turned it over in his hand. I thought you had good taste, Thomas said. I never expected someone like you would purchase counterfeit goods. Sorry, Alexander said with a touch of sarcasm. Is this piece an insult to your design skills? He knew it was and had deliberately placed it there to irritate his younger guest. Thomas made a noise in his throat as he continued to study the object. This is a toy I made when I first started two years ago. I don't like it now, he said. 
Alexander was well aware of Thomas's skill in weapon design. As a core member of Dark Watch, his design work was one of a kind, and if someone wanted to use it, they had to obtain his permission. Alexander leaned against his chair, his legs crossed, and his posture relaxed as he asked, You don't want to hide your identity anymore? What good will it do me to lie to you now? Thomas answered as he looked around the study. Besides, I know you won't tell my sister. Oh, and why is that? Alexander asked, placing his elbows on the desk. You don't want to scare her, Thomas replied casually. He knew it was true because although he hated to admit it, he knew Alexander cared about Samantha. And, Thomas continued with a grin, if my sister knew that her little brother was deeply involved in a crime organization, she wouldn't let me out of her sight. You couldn't bear for me to have all that attention. He's right, Alexander thought. He hated it when Samantha focused all her attention on her brother, but it wasn't the only reason he wouldn't tell her. If people knew about Thomas's connection to Dark Watch, it would make Samantha a target. I'm admitting it to you now because I want you to remember that my sister is not a commodity. She can't be bullied or used. She's powerful and has me and my men on her side, Thomas said. Alexander observed him as he continued to speak. I may never be the CEO of a company like Blue Whale Enterprises, but I have money and a range of skills in weapon design. I may only be young, but if you dare to mistreat my sister or let her down in any way... I'll end you. Alexander thought they were strong words for someone who had been living under his roof. He wondered what Thomas would do if he didn't agree to his terms. He knew Samantha wouldn't leave him. She had proved that to him when he had been suspected of Lorraine's murder. Thomas had never been in a meaningful relationship before, but he could tell that Samantha liked Alexander. There was no point in trying to get her to leave, so all he could do was ensure he took care of her properly. Alexander's mind drifted to past memories. He had once said to Leonard with such righteous indignation that he would never have what he had with Susie. Leonard had warned him that he would never treat Susie as more than a lover. Leonard had been delighted when he had found Aubrey. She hadn't hesitated to abandon her family and go with him. Thomas sometimes reminded him of Leonard. They both tried their best to protect the ones they loved, but that was where the similarities ended. Things were different with Samantha. He had no intention of letting her down. Not that he would admit that to her brother. All right, Thomas. I'll let that threat go because I have no intention of hurting Sam. He said, getting up from the chair. You'd better be telling the truth, Thomas said, his tone threatening. Alexander patted his shoulder and whispered, As your brother-in-law, let me give you one piece of advice. If you want to protect someone, you need to be strong enough first. You don't think I'm strong enough? Thomas asked, squaring his shoulders. He was sure Alexander was trying to rile him again. Although he wasn't physically as strong as Alexander, he was a core member of Dark Watch and had plenty of money. I'm not talking about the brain, but the body, Alexander said. Then, changing the subject, he found himself saying... Thank you for looking out for Missy. Thomas was still fixed on Alexander's words about his strength. He knew his illness, along with his treatment, had left his body weak. He needed to find a bone marrow donor as soon as possible. The online storm caused by Lorraine's murder gradually faded from people's minds. The gossip had turned to a celebrity couple who had announced their divorce due to the husband cheating. Samantha was beginning to feel like her life and career were back on track. She had been asked to model for the spring edition of a renowned fashion magazine. She was also going to participate in a prominent fashion show, which was usually only open to supermodels and those at the peak of their careers. On the day of the show, the models had already started to prepare. They put on makeup and confirmed their sizes and previous experience. When Samantha had first walked in, the hustle and bustle of backstage had turned unusually silent. Samantha had pretended not to notice. She found a runner, confirmed her size, and asked her to bring a dress. 
She busied herself preparing her foundation while the other models talked behind her back in whispers. Is that Sam? Yes, I wondered why Zoe had hired an unknown model, but I guess it's because she has Alexander Brown backing her. It doesn't seem fair, does it? We worked hard to get here, and she just waltzes in. You're not wrong. I worked for years before I was offered a show like this. What has it taken her? Less than six months? Will you lot stop panicking? Said another model, approaching them. When her husband gets tired of her, she'll be out on her ear. How can you sit there and listen to that? Missy asked. Doesn't it make you angry? When Samantha saw Missy pouting, she started to laugh. Didn't you also think I was only interested in Alex for what he could give me? Missy opened her mouth and then closed it again. Samantha could tell she made her uncomfortable. Missy wanted to tell her that she had never considered that was the reason she had married Alexander. As her assistant, she knew her strengths and how hard she worked. She was deciding how to reply when a blonde model approached the stylist who was working on Samantha. Hi, sorry to interrupt, she said in a tone that indicated she clearly wasn't sorry. I need to borrow you. I know you haven't finished with Sam, but she doesn't really matter. Besides, she has a rich husband. I'm sure he can arrange another stylist for her. Samantha kept her expression stoic, but she could tell Missy was affronted. Hey, you can't leave! Missy yelled when the stylist packed up her kit and followed the blonde model. Let it go, Samantha told her. Lexi Morgan is the headliner for today's show. She naturally gets first dibs on the stylists and makeup artists. One day, I hope to be as big as she is, if not bigger. Missy bit down on her lip. She couldn't believe she had felt the need to defend Samantha. It was a strange feeling. But your hair! Missy exclaimed. Missy had been backstage at similar events before, and she had noticed that it was usually the show director who was responsible for ensuring everyone was catered for. Samantha scanned the room for a free stylist. When she spotted someone standing off to the side, she approached her. Are you free to do my hair? she asked. When the stylist turned around, Samantha immediately recognized her. Wow, it's you! she exclaimed. The young stylist looked up and said, Sam, we meet again. Do you remember me? My name is Natalie, Samantha finished for her. She remembered that she had been the stylist whom Brady had invited to work on Lily at the Autumn Car Exhibition. I happen to be free, Natalie said. If you trust me, I'll help with your styling. Of course I trust you. Only the best stylists get to work at these shows, Samantha replied. Besides, I've seen your work, and I know you're very talented. Samantha was pleased when no one else came to look for Natalie, and she was left alone to finish her hair. You, Samantha started to say, but she stopped herself. Natalie had an idea of what Samantha was going to say, and she shrugged her shoulders. I used to work in the entertainment industry. This is my first time being a stylist for such a big show, she said. The other stylists are more experienced than me, so the models flock toward them. Their loss, I guess. That sucks, Missy said. She knew it was a cutthroat industry, but it still seemed unfair to her. Samantha smiled and said, Well, more fool them, but it works in my favor. I get to keep you all to myself. Samantha had been able to model at the show due to her exposure after the Road to the Top competition. She knew she looked fabulous as she walked onto the stage in a Siberian-style floaty red dress, finished with a steel bodice and fur sleeves. As she flickered her hair and worked the catwalk, she appeared powerful and regal, and she knew all eyes were on her. The other models looked at Natalie in surprise, they didn't expect such an inexperienced stylist to do such a fantastic job. Samantha extended her stride to match the beat as the music continued to play. Every step she took was strategically placed, and she had never felt more alive or victorious. Her time on stage hadn't gone unnoticed by the journalists who had been sent to report on the show. They thought she looked arrogant but approachable.
fearless yet fragile, and had her own walking style. When everyone thought she had finished, she appeared on stage for a second time. She had quickly changed into a classic knee-length dress with a puffy hem and shoulder line. It was intricately embroidered in eye-catching colors, making her look classy and elegant. There was a hat to match. Samantha tried her best not to grin underneath the brim. She slowed her pace as she saw shade along the walkway. The skirt swished with her as she walked, and the audience couldn't take their eyes off her. When she had finished, everyone applauded, much to the chagrin of the other models. Missy stood off to the side and took pictures of her on her phone. She already knew that Samantha was beautiful, but being on stage took her beauty to another level. She looked born to walk the catwalk. Missy couldn't believe how much fun she was having as she snapped picture after picture. She tried to remind herself that she didn't like Samantha, but she was too caught up in the moment to care about anything else. When the show ended, everyone was still talking about Samantha. It had been a long time since someone had excited them so much. The agents were determined to poach her from her agency, and they sent people to find out who was managing her. Forget it, one of the older female agents said. That's Sam. She's Lily Miller's sister, and she's contracted to Zoe Jacobs. That's Sam? Two other agents said in unison. They couldn't believe that the Millers had thrown their weight and money behind Lily and let Samantha go unnoticed. By the time the show was over, Zoe had been swamped with offers to take Samantha off her hands. She refused and instead concentrated on the work she was being headhunted for. There were offers to do various catwalk shows as well as an international magazine cover. Many of the older models in the industry went backstage to praise her. She had been the highlight of their day, and they loved to see the underdog do well, particularly in such a large show. Lexi had not forgotten and had been inundated with flowers from fans and other models since she had left the stage. She had received an enormous bouquet of roses from a man in an expensive suit who was wearing a diamond-encrusted watch. Lily was beaming as she cast her eyes towards Samantha and Missy. Missy rolled her eyes. He's so much older than her, she thought. He probably has a wife. Natalie, can you look after Sam? Missy said. I'll be back shortly. Wait, Natalie called out, but Missy had already reached the backstage door. Samantha wasn't like the other models. She didn't drape her body in expensive clothing and take selfies. She hadn't worn any of the limited edition clothing she had picked up from the previous shoots. As soon as she was done, she changed back into her own clothes and took off her makeup. She enjoyed showing the clothes and working with the audience, but when she was finished, she liked to change back into something more comfortable. Natalie, where's Missy? Samantha asked when she came out of the changing rooms. She ran out and said she'd be back soon, Natalie told her. Samantha had sparked a lot of jealousy after being exposed as Alexander's wife, and she had done much better than any of the models could have anticipated. Her presence hadn't gone unnoticed by those in the industry who mattered. They believed she had limitless potential, and they were keen to work with her. Their words had been overheard by a few of the models and had aggravated the situation backstage. Sam, you can't be expected to walk in here and become a sensation. These people are heaping praise on you because of their respect for Zoe. I wouldn't let this go to your head. Look around, Lexi said, pointing to the other models holding their bouquets of flowers. You must feel a little awkward standing there empty-handed. When Lexi finished speaking, the other models stared at Samantha with amusement. I don't play childish games like you, Lexi, Samantha replied. Just because you made it to the top before I did doesn't make you better than me. Remember the competitions we had back in college when you lost out to me? You know as well as I do that the quicker you rise, the harder you fall. Lexi couldn't stand Samantha, not just because she was jealous of her, but because they had been rivals at college. Samantha had been in her first year, Lexi her third. Samantha had taken her title on more than one occasion, and Lexi still held a grudge against her. How dare you? Lexi snapped. 
You think you're high and mighty now because you have a rich husband. Don't you dare bring up the past. Samantha smiled mischievously and whispered, Why would I stay quiet when you insist on bullying me in front of my peers? The other models watched on quietly. They had grown used to following Lexi's lead, but they had decided to stay quiet. They were secretly fascinated by Samantha and didn't want to speak out of turn. Sam, someone has sent you flowers! Missy exclaimed as she walked back into the room carrying a huge bouquet of midnight blue roses. Samantha could hardly see her behind them. For you, Missy said as she handed them to her. Samantha eyed the bouquet suspiciously. Are you sure they're for me? She asked. Missy nodded. Samantha knew instantly that something fishy was going on. Samantha's bouquet looked so elegant and expensive that it made the others pale in comparison. Not long after, a young man wearing a black suit walked into the room. He held a gift box that was filled with champagne and red roses. Hello, may I ask if Sam is here? He said. When he spotted her, he walked directly toward her and said, Sam, congratulations on the show. This is for you. Samantha was confused. She was sure he was a guard from Rock Hill Manor. Missy looked up at her, her eyes full of pride. Take that, suckers, she thought. The atmosphere at the back of the stage instantly became tense again. Everyone knew their flowers didn't compete with Samantha's. Zoe and Tara appeared backstage to give Samantha some good news. Zoe was excited when she said, Your performance turned a lot of heads today. You don't need to concern yourself with what everyone else thinks. Do you understand? Thank you, Zoe. I understand, Samantha said, smiling warmly at her. Zoe was delighted with how the show had gone. Samantha continued to show herself to be talented, intelligent, and capable. The more she saw of her, the more she liked her. Samantha turned to Missy. Who did these come from? She asked. They're enormous. Why are you looking at me like that? Missy asked with a shrug. Where did you get the money for these? Samantha asked. She knew there was a flower shop near the venue's entrance, but the prices were extortionate, and that had been no normal-sized bouquet. My dad unfroze my card, Missy whispered. How did you know it was me? That bodyguard was sent by Alex to protect you. If my husband had wanted to send me flowers, he would have sent Jack or Tim. Missy diverted her eyes. She knew she had been discovered. I appreciate what you did, though, so thank you, Samantha said when she saw Missy's dejected expression. Missy sighed. She didn't want to like Samantha, and being her assistant was meant to be a temporary measure. I didn't do it for you, Missy lied. I just didn't want my cousin to lose face because of you. The stars were shining when Samantha stepped out into the night. She cast her eyes along the street and saw David holding a small bundle of baby's breath. He caught the attention of the remaining models, who had followed her out. Samantha could hear them muttering amongst themselves. Wow, who is that? He's tall and handsome. Is he a new male model or an actor? Whatever he is, he's wealthy enough. That's a very expensive designer suit he's wearing. Congratulations, Sam, David said when she reached him. David held the flowers in one hand and gave her a thumbs up with the other. Such a childish action made Samantha want to laugh. What are you doing here? She asked, giggling. Didn't I say I would find the time to watch your show? You were amazing out there, he said as he passed her the flowers. Samantha was embarrassed, but she knew she had done well, so she accepted his praise. There is still room for improvement, she said. Do you like them? He asked, pointing to the flowers. Yes, they're one of my favorite flowers. How did you know? She asked. Samantha knew that very few people gave the flowers on their own. She had liked the roses, but she loved the purity of the simple, delicate white flower. They also brought back memories for her, which gave them a special place in her heart. David thought of his childhood. It had been her birthday, and after school, she had asked her bodyguards to take her to see him. She held out a piece of cake and said sweetly, 
My little brother nearly ate all of my cake, but I was able to save you a piece. In her eyes, she might have thought of him like any other friend. It might have been because she knew he lived a life of poverty and neglect, and she just felt sorry for him. But he had known in his heart that their friendship was special. He had wanted to give her a gift in return, but he had no money. So instead, he had tiptoed into the local flower shop and pulled out a bunch of roses mixed with baby's breath. When he had been forced to run from the shop, the petals had fallen off of all the roses. By the time he had arrived home, he had been left with only the tiny white flowers. When she had seen them, she broke into a huge smile. How did you know I liked these? she had asked him. He knew the flowers were cheap and had been surprised that she liked them. Missy stayed close while the two of them exchanged small talk. Is that Alexander? Someone asked her in a whisper. No, it's not, Missy said unhappily. I don't know who he is, thought Missy, but he's clearly flirting with her. Tara tried her best to hide her delight. She thought that David cared for Samantha much more than Alexander ever would. After a while, Samantha and David said their goodbyes and went their separate ways. Zoe, Tara, and Missy joined Samantha in the car that was waiting for them. As soon as she sat down, Missy phoned Alexander. Alex, someone tried to bully your wife today, Missy said. Samantha couldn't help laughing to herself as Missy began to tell him all about Lexi. She really fought your corner today, Zoe whispered to Samantha. I know, she replied, her eyes shining with pride. Don't mention it in front of her, or she'll make your life a misery. Samantha watched as Missy continued to chat with Alexander over the phone. Samantha knew that Missy had once been a huge fan of hers, but Missy's attitude towards her had changed after finding out she was married to Alexander. Maybe she doesn't really hate me, Samantha thought. Lost in her own thoughts, Zoe considered what she knew about Susie. Susie was Missy's friend, and Missy had hoped that Susie would back her when it came to making things difficult for Samantha. But Zoe was aware that Susie's affections lay with Leonard. Zoe surmised that Susie had no reason to feel any bad will towards Alexander's new wife. It seemed to Zoe that some women were just born fickle and couldn't allow others to be happy. She hoped Missy wouldn't turn out to be one of them. She pushed the thought from her mind and listened to what Missy was saying over the phone. Whatever Alexander had said, it was clear to her that Missy had disagreed with him. How can you be so indifferent? Missy asked her cousin. Weren't you passionate about anything when you were younger?